we're doing respiratory or respi uh, embryology and lung development it occurs in five stages it begins with the formation of lung bud from distal end of respiratory diverticulum during week four of development okay now uh, stage structural development and notes so there are, there's embryonic uh, stage pseudo uh, glandular canalicular saccular and alveolar the embryonic is it lasts from f uh, four week to seven okay so it lasts four weeks to seven weeks right um, what happens here is you get a lung bud uh, which creates the trachea which then creates bronchial buds um, and then main stem bronchi and secondary lobar bronchi and tertiary segmental bronchi okay so you have all the bronchi uh, For this one, I had a mnemonic that I can't locate right now, but it'll come to me. Let's move on. Error at this stage can lead to tracheoesophageal fistula. Okay. Let's just make one. So for this one. E equals M three squared or degree. Right. Now uh, e equals M three degree. So the three is uh the primary mainstream bronchi, then secondary lobar bronchi and tertiary bronchi. That's what I uh, remind you of and E is for embryonic. Okay. Errors at this stage can lead to tracheoesophageal fistula. Then you have pseudoglandular, week five to 17. Endodermal tubules will lead to terminal bronchioles surrounded by modest capillary network. by modest capillary network, endodermal. For this one, it's about, uh, this is someone else's, it's not mine, but it helps if you remember it. It's uh, pseudo people are pseudo people and or terminate right and then uh, yeah so pseudo people pseudo or false right so false people or bad people usually end or terminate and from false uh, you know, there's a slang for that uh, cap. So, you know, if they're lying or something, they say, it, yo, no, or like they're telling the truth. So they're, yo, I ain't lying or no cap. Right. So the cap will remind you of capillary, uh, pseudo or false people. So pseudo glandular uh, and for endothermal tubules and or terminate so terminal bronchioles okay so endodermal tubules lead to terminal bronchioles surrounded by modest capillary network respiration impossible incomplete with 
life. Okay, so here, um, if a fetus is born during this period, it's not gonna uh, live because respiration is impossible. Why? Because it happens uh, here at respiration capable. That's at 25 weeks, right? So pseudoglandular is from five weeks to 17 weeks, right? And pseudopepal end, so end for endodermal tubule or terminate terminal bronchioles. Uh, so false is like cat, right? So uh, it's surrounded by a modest capillary network. Okay, then there is canalicular. It's in the name, right? Uh, it's a canal, and canal is also known as tract. Right, so track T for terminal bronchioles, uh, R is for respiratory bronchioles, E is for alveolar uh, ducts, right, and then you have surrounded by modest uh, prominent capillary network, not modest. Uh, airway increase in diameter, pneumocytes develop starting at week 20, respiration capable at week 25. So week 25 is where it's available, that's an important uh, point to note. Uh, okay. Pneumocytes develop starting week 20, that's important too. So this is terminal bronchioles, respiratory bronchioles, alveolar duct and then more prominent capillary network. Then you have saccular. Uh, it's in the name, right, saccular, so don't need one for that. It goes from alveolar duct, uh, where it ended here, right, to terminal sacs. So terminal sacs are in saccular. Terminal sacs separated by primary septic. Uh, then you have alveolar, week 36 to 80 years, uh, terminal sex will lead to adult alveoli due to secondary septation. In utero breathing occurs via aspiration and expulsion of amniotic fluid. It leads to increase in pulmonary vascular resistance through gestation at birth. At birth, air replaces fluid, which leads to decrease in pulmonary vascular resistance. Okay. nothing for that <laughs> uh, it's in the name alveolar so from terminal sacs it makes adult alveoli this is uh, from week 36 to 8 years okay. in utero breathing occurs by aspiration and expulsion of amniotic fluid increase in pulmonary vascular resistance through gestation at birth air replaces fluid and decreases the pulmonary vascular resistance cool uh, let's do that one more time so embryonic, it was E equals M3 degree. Uh, so that's three for uh, the three bronchi, menstrual bronchi, secondary bronchi, and tertiary bronchi. And then lung bud and trachea are there as well, right? So error at this phase, uh, stage can cause tracheoesophageal fistula. Pseudoglandular, it's from week five to 17. Uh, respiration is impossible and compatible with life. And pseudo people, uh, end or terminate or end. no cap or cap you know so end is for endodermal tubules and uh, terminate is for terminal bronchioles okay bronchioles that's important okay because uh, here we have terminal uh, sac as well so bronchioles surrounded by modest capillary network canalicular is uh, canal canal is like a track so track is T for terminal bronchioles, uh, R is for respiratory bronchioles, A is for alveolar duct, and C was for capillary network. Airway increases in diameter, uh, pneumocytes develop starting week 20, and respiration capable at week 25. Saccular, uh, it's in the name, it creates terminal sacs from alveolar duct, uh, then terminal sacs separated by primary septa. Uh, then you have alveolar uh, stage, 
this is from week 36 uh, birth and then eight years after that uh, you have terminal sex adult alveoli right uh, alveolar so from terminal sex you have adult alveoli due to secondary septations okay uh, so that's there good need to know about this thing here and then they might ask you uh, one of these in which week or which stage does uh, like terminal bronchial develop or alveolar duct or terminal sacs or something like that okay, uh, okay so now we're at coenal atresia coenal atresia is a blockage of posterior nasal opening often associated with bony abnormalities of the mid face most often unilateral when bilateral represents an emergency and presents with upper airway obstruction noisy breathing and or cyanosis that worsens during feeding and improves with crying diagnosed by failure to pass nasopharyngeal tube and confirmed with ct scan often it's part of multiple malformation syndromes such as charge syndrome that's coloba of my uh, coloboma of eye heart defects atresia of cona uh, restricted growth and development genital urinary defects and ear defects so uh, you need to what know what this looks like so so that Okay, so that's this thing. It looks like a keyhole. Okay. And yeah, so remember charge for coenal atresia. Uh, anyways, if like you have atresia of your conas, uh, you know you can't breathe. So if you can't breathe, there's obstruction their noisy breathing is going to happen or and or cyanosis right uh, it's a it's uh, part of a group of malformation right so let's do that let's see if we can figure it out so c was for coloboma of i h was for uh, heart defects a was for what are we for? It was for something. R is for uh, A is for atresia of cona. This thing. R was for restricted growth and development. G was for genital urinary defects, and then E was ear defect. Okay. Uh, lung malformations pulmonary hypoplasia poorly developed bronchial tree with abnormal histology okay. so pulmonary hypoplasia this is just poorly developed bronchial tree with abnormal histology associated with congenital diaphragmatic hernia usually left-sided bilateral renal agenesis potter sequence Okay, so it's associated with that. This is the important one. We'll learn about that uh, in patho, I guess. Okay. Uh, it uh, Potter stands for pulmonary hypoplasia, oligohydrolaminose, T for twisted face and twisted skin, and E for extremity defects and renal failure. Okay. So it's associated with that and associated with congenital diaphragmatic hernia, usually left-sided. Okay, so since uh, there's no support there, the diaphragm is going to collapse to that and then poorly. Okay, cool. Bronchiogenic cysts caused by abnormal budding of the foregut and dilation of terminal or large bronchi. Discrete, round, shape, sharply defined 
fluid filled densities on chest x-ray air filled if infected generally asymptomatic but can drain poorly it leads to airway compression and recurrent respiratory infection okay uh, not really that high yield uh, this one is but it's usually because of this one uh, club cell non ciliated low columnar cuboidal with secretory granules located in bronchioles degrade toxins via cytochrome p450 secretes uh, component of surfactant progenitor cells for club and ciliated cells okay so this is important you need to know about this so it's non ciliated low columnar or cuboidal with secretory granules it's located in bronchioles okay so these are the bronchioles right here so it's located in that okay and it goes down to terminal bronchioles and respiratory bronchioles so all of the bronchioles you'll see club cells okay uh, so it degrades uh, toxins via cytochrome p450 important to remember that uh, secrete uh, component of surfactant progenitor cells for club and ciliated cells uh, alveolar cell types type 1 pneumocytes it's squamous 97% of alveolar surfaces are this right so you see how this one is squamous so squamous is you know squished so so it's going to be like that's what squamous is and then like a little nuclei over there Okay, so squamous, 97% of the alveolar surface. It's thinly, it thinly lines the alveoli for optimal gas exchange. This is cuboidal, and then you have columnar. Right? So type one, it's, uh, it's 97% of the alveolar surface. It's meant for gas exchange. Uh, that's the function. Okay, and then you have type 2 uh, pneumocytes, very important. This is the most important out of these two. So cuboidal and clustered, uh, two functions. It serves as a stem cell precursor for two cell types, type 1 and type 2 pneumocytes, and proliferate during lung damage. So there will be a case of a person who went through and lung damage because of uh, corrosive breathing, um, corrosive gas breathing in, or like maybe there was a fire and they breathed in the hot air. So they burnt their lungs. So which type of cells are you going to see most uh, in the alveoli? You will see type 2 the most, right? Because that's the one that serves as stem cell precursor and it proliferates during lung damage. Okay. It secretes surfactant as well from lamellar bodies. That's important to remember. Arrows in B. Okay, so lamellar body and you and okay. Surfactant decreases alveolar surface tension. Uh, it decreases alveolar collapse and decreases lung recoil and increases compliance. How? Uh, it prevents collapse, right? That's why. Uh, composed of multiple lecithins, mainly dipalmatoyl phosphatidylcholine or DPPC. Synthesis begins uh, approximately 20 weeks of gestation and achieves mature level by 35 weeks of gestation. Glucocorticoids, important for fetal surfactant synthesis and lung development. Okay, so this is an important point. Okay, uh, collapsing pressure is uh, P equals 2 surface tension over radius. Law of Laplace uh, is alveoli have increased tendency to collapse on expiration as radius decreases. Right, uh, just real quick so you have alveoli, right, and see there's the chest wall. Okay. So when you're expiring, uh, what happens? The chest wall uh, goes into itself, diaphragm goes up, 
which causes uh, uh, tension on the outside pushing inward so the air that was in here it goes out into the uh, uh, from the alveoli to the airway right the airway tract uh, so this thing then can collapse on each uh, on itself right because if the pressure is coming it's going to collapse but something there is preventing that from that happening right and it's known as surfactant because there's surfactant inside here so only air can escape it not surfactant so it can only this thing can only get so small until you know it can't get smaller than this because of surfactant so it's preventing collapse of that okay so composed of multiple lecithins, mainly DPPC, and synthesis begins approximately 20 weeks of gestation and achieves mature level by level 35 weeks. Okay. Uh, just a sec. And okay, so collapsing pressure. So uh, what can we think about this formula? So say the radius decreases, right? Then collapsing pressure increases, right? If this decreases, and this increases, right? Or uh, if the uh, surface tension decreases and radius increases, uh, then this, decreases right the collapsing pressure decreases with okay so collapsing pressure equals two surface tension two times the surface tension divided by the radius so law of Laplace's alveoli have increased tendency to collapse on expiration as radius decreases then there is also alveolar macrophages they phagocytize uh, foreign materials release cytokines and alveolar proteases. Hemosiderin laden macrophages may be found in the setting of pulmonary edema or alveolar hemorrhage. Okay. Uh, neonatal distress syndrome, surfactant deficiency will increase surface tension and lead to alveolar collapse, uh, ground glass appearance of lung fields. Okay, so that uh, important thing to note is that it's because of this that's what causes this uh, increase in surface tension leads to alveolar collapse uh, ground glass appearance of lung fields risk factor is prematurity that's usually the cause uh, diabetes during pregnancy due to increase in fetal insulin c-section delivery and decre uh, decreased release of fetal glucocorticoids less stressful than vaginal delivery Right. Uh, treatment is maternal glucocorticoids before birth, exogenous surfactant for infant. Therapeutic supplemental O2 can result in retinopathy of prematurity. Right, we know that because uh, it activates the VEGF and VEGF does angiogenesis. So, uh, what else causes angiogenesis? FGF. Uh, therapeutic supplemental O2 can result in retinopathy of prematurity, intravascular hemorrhage, and bronchopulmonary dysplasia or rib. Okay. Screening test for fetal lung maturity, lecithin sphingomyelin L by S ratio in amniotic fluid. So if it's more than two, it's healthy. If it's less than 1.5 predictive, predictive of NRDS, uh, okay, if it's less than that. And then foam stability index, surfactant albumin ratio. Persistently low O2 tension leads to risk of PDA. Okay, um, this is important, but all you have to do is remember this and what this chart looks like, because that's what the chart is gonna, they're gonna show you without the names. Right, so then you have to figure out what it is. Uh, so you have LS ratio and lecithin, and another thing 
thing about lecithin you need to know is that So known as phosphatidyl choline. Okay. So if they don't give you listen, they'll give you this. And if there's something that goes from here to here, uh, it's this so as long as the ratio is above 1.5 it's good if it's less than 1.5 it's predictive of neonatal respiratory distress syndrome okay this is the LS ratio it's uh, you know it's low over here concentration and gestational age is right there and then this as lecithin uh, goes up uh, sphingomyelin goes down after it reaches the uh, LS ratio at 5 right or this line yeah okay they won't ask you anything about this they just ask you what could it be that this line is representing it's lecithin also phosphatidylcholine that's what it's known for okay uh okay on to anatomy let's take a break here and for like respi anatomy uh respiratory tree there's conduction zone and respiratory zone conducting zone is uh it consists of this part right here now up till the terminal bronchial So large airways, large airways consists of nose, pharynx, larynx, trachea, and bronchi. Airway resistance highest in the large to medium sized bronchi. Small airways consist of bronchioles that further divide into terminal bronchioles. Large numbers in parallel lead to least airway resistance. Okay. Uh, that's just you know if there's a large airway and then this one gets split into this 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 and this that means the resistance is going to decrease because uh, it's getting split okay sorry uh, resistance is going to increase yeah because here it's easier to flow through right rather than you know a small one so this increases uh, over here uh, it warms humidifies and filters air but does not participate in gas exchange so this is known as the anatomic dead space dead space is considered part of uh, a space where it's part of the respiration but it doesn't uh, participate in gas exchange uh, cartilage and goblet cells extend to the end of bronchi so these are the goblet cells and then you have cartilage right there and it extends to the end of bronchi pseudostratified uh, ciliated columnar cells primarily make up epithelium of bronchus and extend to beginning of terminal bronchioles then transition to cuboidal cells. They clear mucus and debris from lungs. Okay, uh, that's what cuboidal cells do. Okay, because it's ciliated. And then you have airway, uh, smooth muscle cells. 
extend to the end of terminal bronchioles sparse point uh, beyond that so it's there but it's not as much okay so this is important so let's look at that bronchi it has goblet cells basal cells and ciliated cells uh, the ciliated ones are called pseudo stratified uh, ciliated columnar epithelium uh, then you have the smooth muscle and then the cartilage and bronchi uh, where the cartilage ends is where bronchioles start and bronchioles also gets rid of the goblet cells because you don't need mucus uh, clogging up your bronchioles right uh, so club cells and ciliated cells now it's called just the simple ciliated columnar epithelium and smooth muscle then you have terminal bronchioles where you have cuboidal ciliated cells uh, club cells uh, simple ciliated cuboidal epithelium and smooth muscle over there then you have respiratory zone right so this is the lung parenchyma consists of respiratory bronchioles alveolar duct and alveoli participates in gas exchange mostly cuboidal cells and respiratory bronchioles then simple squamous cells up to alveoli cilia terminate in respiratory bronchioles alveolar macrophages clear debris and participating immune response okay so in respiratory bronchial you have the cuboidal cells you have the club cells right you had it from here the bronchioles to respiratory bronchioles uh, then you uh, the ciliated cuboidal cells turn into squamous cell over here so simple cuboidal and squamous epithelium smooth muscle so the cuboidal one are, I guess are these right type 2 and the squamous ones are type 1 because type 2 is cuboidal and it's clustered okay sure uh, okay so they only exist in the alveolar sac but it's similar that's cuboidal and that's squamous okay, and then there has smooth muscle which is sparse uh, in alveolar sac you have type 1 pneumocyte uh, type 2 pneumocyte and alveolar macrophage and capillary okay alveolar macrophage also clears debris and participate in immune response what else does that the ciliated ones right they clear mucus and debris okay uh, lung anatomy so you have trachea carina right and left bronchus right lung has three lobes because left lobe has heart so it takes up a lobe there so right lung has three lobes left has less lobes and lingula homology of in middle right middle lobe instead of a middle lobe left lung has a space occupied by the heart okay so right there relation of the pulmonary artery to the bronchus at each lung hilum is described as rails right anterior left is superior that's the pulmonary artery it goes uh, on the right it goes superior and uh, to the hilum I guess and the left sorry anterior and the left is superior oh, yeah that's what it is okay uh, carina is posterior to ascending aorta and entom enteromedial to descending aorta right lung is a more common site for inhaled foreign bodies because right main stem bronchus is wider more vertical and shorter than the left if you aspirate a peanut while supine uh, it usually okay so let's draw a dude supine so he's sleeping like this his little face over there and that's his lungs and 
then he uh, aspires a peanut and while supine usually enters the superior portion of the right lobe okay. over there we should just put that on this side this over here and now we have on the superior lobe okay. on superior segment of the right lower lobe so right lower lobe so the three segments that like that like so like that just over there uh while laying on right side usually enters so now he's facing you okay so are the arms and feet okay so right side it usually enters the right upper lobe okay so right upper lobe over there and while upright it enters the right lower lobe okay uh, they didn't mention the segments there uh, when they're uh, supine, it's superior segment of the right lower lobe, but it's also posterior side. Okay, so they'll have a picture like this, or maybe, you know, just talk, tell you about it, that this guy was sleeping and then he has aspired it, something. Uh, where will you find it? Uh, the most common like part is like the posterior side of the lung. It could be anywhere from here to here. Uh, this is not that important but uh, what is is that the pleura ends at uh, starts at 10 and that's where the visceral lung ends right so when you want to uh, you know when you want to do the draining uh, for a pleural fusion or something this is where you're gonna puncture below the 9 and 10 intercostal space okay so it's important to know that on the back on the on this side it's going to be below 10 I guess and in the front it's below this intercostal space okay so you have right upper lobe right middle lobe and right lower lobe left upper lobe and left lower lobe uh, this pattern is important to know uh, that you have SVC, ascending aorta, descending aorta, and pulmonary artery. So it goes SAP. What is that? Okay, and then you have Perino over there. This is at the level of, did you mention? What level? Diaphragm structures. Uh, it's inferior vena cava. Uh, T8, central tendon, esophagus T10, rib. Uh, aorta is at T12, vertebra, and inferior view. Okay, structures perforating your uh, diaphragm. Okay, so you have a diaphragm like that. So what's penetrating at? All right, so it's sort of bigger than this. Because right? you have a big stomach. So it's this big. Okay, so at T8, see this is T8. You will have IVC, right phrenic nerve over there. That's what they perforate, IVC. Just make that blue. Okay, and you have a nerve over there, a oh, phrenic nerve. At T10, it's esophagus and vagus, so cranial nerve 10, two tongues, uh, trunks. At T12, it's aorta, uh, thoracic duct, a zygous vein. They don't normally test you on these, so I'll just go through it. Diaphragm innervated by C5 to 5, uh, sorry, C3 to 5. This is phrenic. They test you on phrenic, you need to know about that, but we'll do that in musculo. Uh, 
Pain from diaphragm irritation can be referred to shoulder and trapezius ridge. Phrenic nerve injury causes elevation of ipsilateral hemidiaphragm on x-ray. Number of letter equals T level, so T8, so eight letters is mina cava. Uh, that's how you remember IBC. And then T10, so there are 10 letters, esophagus. And then you have 12, which is 12 letters is aortic hiatus. Uh, then you have, uh, yeah, that's not going to help. So C3, 4, 5, keep the diaphragm alive. Other bifurcations uh, you should know are the common keratid bifurcates at C4, the trachea bifurcates at T4, and abdominal aorta bifurcates at L4. Out of these, just remember this one. That's the only important one. Uh, abdominal aorta bifurcating at L4. Okay. Uh, on to physiology. So total lung volumes and capacities. Note, a capacity is a sum of more than two physiologic volumes. There are four volumes and four capacities. Okay. Four volumes and four capacities. You have tidal volume. So tidal volume is just you breathing in and out, right? Normally. Uh, so it's the air that moves into the lung with quite uh, each quiet inspiration. Okay, so it's around six to eight mL per kg, or typically around five hundred mL. That's the one we remember. Then you have inspiratory reserve volume. This is air that can still be breathed in after normal inspiration, right? So at the end of normal inspiration, to end of uh, inspiration basically right so from here to here it's uh, inspiratory reserve volume this is a volume so it's a single uh, quantity right uh, and then you have expiratory reserve volume this is air that can be breathed out after a normal expiration so say this is your normal expiration from there uh, to here is your expiratory reserve volume because that's how much you expired okay then there's uh, residual volume again single quantity so air in lung after maximal expiration so even after maximal respiration you have uh, some residual volume that why is that important it prevents the collapse right so that's what prevents the collapse so you need that so air in lung after maximum expiration uh, residual volume any lung capacity that includes RV cannot be measured by spirometry right so spirometry is just you taking breath in and then uh, breathing out and into the pipe and the pipe captures uh, how much volume of air you're breathing out Okay, so you can do all of them almost, this, um, except for the ones that include RV. Okay, uh, so now we are on to capacities. So capacities are capacities are going to be two or more uh, quantities you deal with. So inspiratory reserve volume plus uh, tidal volume, right? So normal plus this. Okay, so that's at the end of uh, expiration to the end of maximum inspiration. Air that can be breathed in, breathe in after normal exhalation. Okay, so this is important. It's from you exhaling normal to all the way up there. And this is your inspiratory capacity. Okay, uh, then you have functional residual capacity. This is residual volume with uh, and respiratory sorry expiratory reserve volume right so residual volume plus ERV volume of gas in lungs after normal expiration outward play sorry 
talking about air in mouth is making me yawn. <laughs> Volume of gas in lungs after normal expiration. Outward pulling force of chest wall is balanced with inward collapsing force of lungs. And so when you breathe in, this is your lungs. Those are your lungs, okay. And let's just make diaphragm over here. Okay, and arms. So it looks realistic. Some legs. And I just look like Kool-Aid man. So let's give him a neck. And a head. Okay. So when uh, volume of air in lungs after normal expiration. So when you expire, what's going to happen, right? So normally what happens is this thing is uh, pulling outwards while this thing is pulling inwards, right? And there is a uh, vacuum in this space right here. Okay. Don't talk about space beyond that. For this uh, so there's a vacuum here so that's going to keep the balance between the collapse of uh, you know this and completely outgoing of this so it's outward pulling force of the chest wall so it's it going this way and this way while this is going inwards right so residual volume and expected reserve volume Residual volume or wait Expected reserve volume. Yeah, so that prevents collapse of this This one Okay uh, Vital capacity is inspiratory reserve volume uh, tidal Volume and and respiratory volume Maximum volume of gas that can be expired after maximal inspiration Okay uh, total lung capacity is just all the volumes together so inspiratory reserve volume tidal wave volume uh, expiratory reserve volume and residual volume it equals to vital capacity plus RV so vital capacity is everything except for RV and if RV is involved that's your total lung capacity okay that's it work of breathing it refers to the energy expended or o2 consumed by respiratory muscles to produce the ventilation needed to meet the body's metabolic demands comprises the work needed to overcome both elastic recoil and airway resistance that is work equals force times distance uh, which are e also equals to pressure times volume minimized by optimizing respiratory rate and uh, tidal volume increase in restrictive diseases increase work to overcome elastic recoil achieved by increase achieved with increase in respiratory rate and decrease in tidal volume and obstructive diseases increase work to overcome airway resistance achieved with decrease in respiratory rate and tidal volume Okay, so it refers to the energy expended or O2 consumed by the respiratory muscles. Why? To produce ventilation needed to meet the body's metabolic demands. Uh, okay, so it, what does it consist of? It consists of the work needed to overcome both the elastic recoil, right? So the alveoli uh, has a tendency to collapse on itself, right? So it has to overcome the work of breathing has to overcome that uh, surface tension and you know elastic recoil and also the airway resistance uh, in the bronchioles okay uh, so the formula we can use is force times distance how much force is needed uh, to cover how much distance or uh, how much pressure and volume so minimize by optimizing respiratory rate so you can decrease the amount of work needed if you're 
increasing the amount of respiratory rate. So normal respiratory rate is uh, between 12 and 20. So if it becomes 24, that means uh, you don't have to breathe in that much. Uh, you don't have to put in that much work, uh, but you'll get the same amount of O2 as a result in your system, right? And uh, tidal volume as well. No, so increase that too. So increase in uh, increase in restrictive diseases, the work. So work to overcome elastic recoil achieved in, and so that is achieved with increase in respiratory rate and instead of 500 milliliters, uh, we only do like a little, so like 200 milliliters. But we increase from 20 respiratory rate to like 20, 28 or something to make up for it. Uh, yeah, and in obstructive, uh, we do that by decreasing in, decreasing the respiratory rate and increasing the tidal volume. We'll do that in COPD. Uh, determination of physiological, uh, physiologic dead space. So this is VD, phys physiologic dead space, is equal to VT. Uh, tidal volume times the carbon dioxide minus the okay so arterial carbon dioxide um, minus the expired air carbon dioxide okay and divided by uh, carbon dioxide in the arteries right so this is how much it's uh, how much is in the arteries this is how much is coming in or uh, going out right uh, this is how much is going out sorry expired here okay so you have arteries and PaCO2 is coming in and then it's getting lifted out and exchanged into the um, airways so you're taking this and it's whatever is taking going out divided by how much is left uh, how much was there to start off with right so you're getting how much uh, basically what the difference is and the difference is the physiologic dead space okay anatomic dead space of conducting airways plus alveolar dead space apex of he healthy lung is largest contributor of alveolar dead space because it's called uh, a wasted ventilation because it's not perfused as well as uh, the lower lobes sorry uh, okay so what dead space is equal to volume of inspired air that does not take part in gas exchange this is important to remember that dead space is the part that's not involved in gas exchange Uh, physiologic dead space approximately equivalent to anatomic dead space in normal lungs may be greater than anatomic dead space in lung disease with ventilation perfusion mismatch okay. okay so physiologic dead space is the dead space you find in the tracheas, right? Because no gas exchange happens there, and the bronchi is in the terminal bronchi, and then it starts from the respiratory bronchioles, right? Where the gas exchange occurs. So besides that, everything else is considered physiologic dead space because uh, no gas exchange is happening there. However, uh, in certain diseases, gas exchange doesn't happen here either like fibrosis or uh, restrictive or something like that, right? So that's considered anatomic dead space. Okay. Wait. So physiology, anatomic dead space of conducting air plus alveolar dead space. Apex of alveolar dead space. I just want to clarify what the difference is.
So anatomic dead space describes the volume of air that does not penetrate gas exchange regions of the lung, while physiological dead space describes the anatomical dead space. Plus the volume of air that penetrates gas exchange region but does not undergo gas exchange. Yeah, so that's the anatomical dead space. So that's the that would be the pathological one. Yeah. And this would be the physiological one in the trachea. Okay. Uh, ventilation. Uh, minute ventilation and alveolar ventila uh, ventilation. So minute ventilation is abbreviated as VE. Total volume of gas entering lungs per minute. Uh, so VE equals uh, tidal volume times respiratory rate, right? So you just need to remember the normal values. So respiratory rate is 12 to 20 breaths per minute. Tidal volume is 500. And then you have minute, uh, sorry, dead space volume. That's uh, 150 ml per breath. Okay. Uh, so alveolar ventilation, abbreviated as uh, VA. Volume of gas that reaches alveoli each minute. Uh, so alveolar ventilation is equal to tidal volume minus the dead space times RR. So that's the alveolar ventilation. Uh, I don't think you need to remember these formulas. Just as long as you remember that this is what it is. Uh, lung and chest wall. Because of histor historical reasons and small pressures, pulmonary pressures are always presented in CMH2O. Okay. Uh, elastic recoil. So this is the tendency for lungs to collapse inwards and uh, chest wall to spring out. At FRC, functional residual capacity, airway, and that is this thing. Uh, residual volume plus the expiratory tree reserve volume. So at FRC, airway and alveolar pressure equals atmospheric pressure, right? So it's called zero. Uh, and intrapleural pressure is negative, preventing atelectasis. The inward pool of the lung is balanced by the outward pool of the chest wall. Systemic pressure is atmospheric. Pulmonary vascular resistance is at minimum. Lung and chest wall. Because of historical reasons and small pressures, pulmonary pressures are always presented in centimeter H2O. Elastic recoil. Tendency for lungs to collapse inward and chest wall to spring out. At FRC, airway and alveolar pressures equal atmospheric pressure, that's PB, uh, which is called zero. And intrapleural pressure is negative, preventing atelectasis. The inward pool of the lung is balanced by the outward pool of the chest wall. Okay. Uh, sy system pressure is atmospheric. Pulmonary vascular resistance is at win minimum. That's PBR for pulmonary vascular resistance. Uh, you have lung volume here. During inspiration, it goes into the positives. Uh, expiration. Uh, it goes into the negative. This is functional residual capacity. For alveolar pressure, it goes uh, negative and then positive during expiration, right? So what it's saying is that the chest wall, right, and the lungs. So the chest wall has a tendency to go outwards, right? And uh, alveolar has a tendency to collapse on itself. So this, uh, during expiration, what's happening? The diaphragm is going upwards as well, right? So it's pushing onto the lungs. Uh, the chest wall is going inwards, um, as well as the alveoli is going inwards as well. So overall, it's creating a negative over there. However, in the intrapleural pressure, um, this pressure right here between the chest wall and the lungs, it's going uh, positive, 
towards the positive still in negative but towards the positive right why because the difference between the two pressures the chest wall and the alveolar pressure is coming closer to zero right and that's why it's called zero uh, okay uh, at the end of expiration and yeah so just remember this has a tendency to collapse it's called elastic recoil uh, so if we didn't have the residual volume or surfactant and all that stuff it would have collapsed on itself okay uh, compliance change in lung volume for a change in pressure so uh, delta v over delta p inversely proportional to wall stiffness and increased by surfactant there's an increase in compliance which is e equal to lung easier to fill right so just imagine like you have a balloon right uh, so increase in compliance means uh, whatever you put in like water it's gonna expand and accommodate the fluid right just like air so if it was air like alveoli it would just accommodate that so that's increase in compliance uh, the reason is it loses its elastic recoil in uh, if there's a pathology like emphysema right so lung are easier to fill for example emphysema and older adults then you have decrease in compliance which is equal to lung more difficult to fill for example pulmonary fibrosis pneumonia ARDS pulmonary edema okay so increase in compliance that and now imagine you have cement on the top of the balloon or in like in this layer of the balloon right if you have cement over here or here that's similar to pulmonary fibrosis right because uh, it's not going to expand uh, no matter how much pressure you create this is not going to expand right it's going to be harder than it was before when it was just by itself and that right why does it do that it requ uh, again that's because it loses its elastic elasticity in emphysema uh, okay and also in this you have fibrosis or pneumonia or ARDS or pulmonary edema all of these will cause decrease in compliance right so like in pulmonary edema you have fluid in your alveoli right so it's taking up all of this so when the air comes in when you're breathing in it's not gonna create pressure enough to overcome this fluid so this is not going to expand and be compliant right so it's going to stay that way you know, because of uh, pulmonary edema similar thing with ARDS there's fluid permeability there and then pneumonia is just you know consolidation and all that stuff there again air it doesn't have enough pressure to overcome that uh, you have hysteresis lung inflation follows a different pressure volume curve that lung then lung deflation due to the need to overcome surface tension forces during inflation right the inertia okay so you have volume transpulmonary static pressure on this side and uh, h2o so when you this is the line that you follow uh, for normal in emphysema there's a left shift okay like that and in fibrosis, there's a right shift. Um, this will be easier to understand if you just remember. In restrictive, it goes right shift. So restrictive starts with R, and right shift is R, right? So in uh, COPD, emphysema, and all that stuff, asthma, is going to have a left shift because that's an obstructive uh, pulmonary disease, and that causes left shift. Uh, yeah so left shift or up if it's going like that or like that but you can just think of it left and right and it still works 
and you don't have to worry about other stuff then. okay uh, pulmonary circulation normally a low resistance high compliance system a decrease in partial pressure or oxygen in alveoli causes hypoxic vasoconstriction okay that shifts blood away from poorly ventilated regions of lung to well ventilated regions of the lung this is important because normally what happens in uh, hypoxic conditions in other uh, parts of your body it vasodilates but in lungs it's different it actually vasoconstricts why because if this is your lung and say there's a disease over here uh, over here right uh, that's preventing the gas exchange or you know oxygen diffusion or whatever uh, the body is smart enough to vasoconstrict these vessels, the vessels coming into this. Right, vessels coming into this. And instead, uh, open up uh, these. Or because of this increased resistance, the flow is going to get diverted into the ones that are not vasoconstricted. Because these are well perfused. And that's... Uh, a mechanism for hypoxic conditions uh, if there is a perfusion uh, limited so what is perfusion limited basically uh, it's oxygen normal health carbon dioxide and nitric oxide gas equilibrates early along the length of the capillary okay so if this is a capillary okay, and this is the alveoli right what's gonna happen is the carbon well, carbon di uh, dioxide comes in and gets diffused outwards and this happens quicker than when oxygen comes in uh, and diffuses so this is slower okay so if you're say hyperventilating normally carbon dioxide washout happens way quicker than oxygen coming in and that's why you get lightheaded okay uh, so what they're saying here is that uh, perfusion is basically uh, you know just by the definition it's uh, the blood supply to the alveoli. Uh, and you get oxygen, carbon dioxide, and nitric oxide coming in. Gas equilibrates early along the length of the capillary. So early along the length. So carbon dioxide uh, goes out, and as carbon dioxide goes out, oxygen also tries to take its place, right? But remember, there are four molecules to a cell. So the affinity between the molecules increases as... Uh, the oxygen takes place in the hemoglobin, right? So there's one oxygen, uh, hemoglobin, two hemoglobin, three hemoglobin, and four hemoglobin. So if oxygen is, you know, taking place on one hemoglobin, then the affinity for oxygen for the same cell is going to increase uh, exponentially. Uh, similarly, so after there are two uh, oxygen molecules to a cell, uh, there's increase in another one for this. And then again, exponentially, same thing for this one as well. Like so. And that's how... Uh, and this thing happens early on in the capillary, even before it reaches here. So it, uh, the partial pressure of oxygen reaches like 100% even before it reaches like halfway in the capillary. Okay. So capillary equilibrates uh, early along the length of the capillary. Sorry, gas equilibrates. And exchange can be increased only if blood flow is increased. So now the only way this can be any faster is uh, if the blood flow increases.
there is diffusion limited so from see this is the membrane actually let's make so in the alveoli between the capillary and this alveoli this is the membrane right your capillary and alveoli this is just a cross section of the alveoli and I guess this would be your capillary then right. lining the alveoli so uh, diffusion is uh, O2 oxygen uh, and emphysema of fibrosis and carbon monoxide Gas does not equilibrate by the time uh, blood reaches the end of the capillary. So remember, I was talking about fibrosis. So what's going to happen in fibrosis? It's like cement, right? Let's get cement uh, over here. Right. So the blood coming in. It's gonna have a hard time getting diffused or like uh, air coming in right it's gonna have a hard time getting from this alveoli into the capillary because of this uh, fibrosis cement like fibrosis right uh, and that's uh, diffusion limited so that. Uh, also emphysema uh, I remember that one We'll learn about that. So O2 uh, diffuses slowly while carbon, yeah, so this is what I was talking about. O2 diffuses slowly while carbon uh, dioxide diffuses very rapidly uh, across the alveolar membrane. Disease states that lead to diffusion limitation, for example, fi pulmonary fibrosis are more likely to cause early hypoxia than hypercapnia because this is faster so the washout happens way faster right uh, but the oxygen comes in a little slower so that's why you have hypoxia before you have hypercapnia in the cement like condition or fibrosis okay uh, chronic hypoxic vasoconstriction may lead to pulmonary hypertension with or without core pulmonale right so core pulmonale is basically uh, right heart failure due to uh, pulmonary causes right so when there is congestion and all that stuff in the lungs it increases the pressure and uh, systolic pressure in right ventricle right uh, so that leads to like uh, right ventricular hypertrophy Eisenmenger uh, then right to left shunting type of thing and leading to basically right heart failure. So that's what core pulmonale is. Just make sure. Uh, is the condition that causes the right side of the heart to fail. Long term high blood pressure in the arteries of the lung and right ventricle, right, so that's congestion. And right ventricle of the heart leads to core pulmonary. Okay. Uh, then there is something called diffusion. Uh, we already talked about that. So diffusion is equal to, so we did perfusion, diffusion, and ventilation. That's what's missing. Uh, they didn't mention it here. It's over here. Okay, we'll talk about it there. Uh, so uh, diffusion is equal to A, which is area, times the diffusion coefficient of gas, times uh, P1 minus P2, that's the difference in partial pressures, divided by increase in pulmonary fibrosis, uh, delta X. Okay. Uh, not important. It's okay if you don't remember this. Just remember what perfusion is, what diffusion is. 
okay and then we do uh, we use carbon monoxide DLCO is the extent to which CO passes from air sacs of lungs into blood this is what we use to check for diffusion uh, or perfusion yeah diffusion related uh, diseases that's how we see like we calculate we actually give them carbon uh, monoxide and then check the blood content of carbon monoxide and then that's how we know if we're giving like 100% and then you only find 20% uh, in there that means there is severe uh, it's severely diffusion limited breathing right uh, for example just an example so DLCO is the extent to which CO passes from air sacs to the lungs into blood So you have uh, carbon, let's just draw this, okay. the capillary in a alveoli, okay, that's the alveoli. And air sac, right. So Carbon dioxide comes in from here, CO2, so partial pressure of that, um, and we're going to look at partial pressure of oxygen as well. Okay, uh, Let's do oxygen first. Uh, so uh, the amount of oxygen that's going to come into the lungs is going to be really low, right? Because it comes through the venous return and venous content for oxygen is usually really low because your body uses up all the oxygen. Okay, so it starts off right here at the lowest point. Okay, and then as it goes along, it gets perfused, right? And uh, it gets perfused really quickly even before it reaches halfway, right? So if this is the length of the pulmonary capillary, that's this length, uh, even before it reaches this halfway right here, uh, it's already fully perfused or like you know equilibrated so all the sites for oxygen have been filled up uh, right there okay that's what that is uh, so say you have fibrosis here right there's a cement like fibrosis or like you know it's because of some kind of scarring or something uh, then the oxygen is not gonna diffuse inwards right as fast as it used to so there is a state of hypoxia a little you'll have a decreased par partial pressure of oxygen what partial pressure of oxygen is is basically how many how much particle you have in this uh, blood of oxygen right and then uh, you have cells inside cells. okay just pretend like that's a cell uh, you have cells inside and this oxygen then gets picked up on uh, onto the into the cell right so that would be the saturation okay so when it's inside the cell it, we are talking about oxygen saturation okay and uh, when we are talking about oxygen in the uh, capillaries and blood vessels and all that that's partial pressure of oxygen Okay, so since it's uh, you will have lower partial pressure because uh, oxygen comes in a little later, uh, it causes a decrease in partial pressure of oxygen, right? Uh, and it doesn't get equilibrated at all as much as it used to without the fibrosis, right? So it still hasn't reached the equilibrium, uh, equilibration, right? It keeps continuing going upwards. There is no... Uh, place where it's a straight line like this right it's still going a little slanted upwards so yeah that's the chart for fibrosis uh, next we will talk about uh, carbon dioxide so for carbon dioxide uh, when it's coming in it's going to be the highest content in the capillary right because again it comes from the venous return from uh, IVC SVC and then it goes into the RA, RV, and then into the lungs. And the lungs will then come in with oxygen 
uh, sorry, carbon dioxide at the highest partial pressure of the capillary. Okay, so that's the highest point for carbon uh, dioxide. Uh, okay, so when carbon dioxide then uh, goes as it goes along the length of uh, the capillary, it's going to get kicked out from the cell and that's why there's the partial pressure is decreased over here okay another thing uh, carbon dioxide and oxygen are always at equilibrium so if one increases the other will decrease if other decreases the other one will increase okay that's why when this is high this is low when this is low this is high okay uh, so after that again then it's equilibrated and then you have the least amount of it along this length of the capillary. Okay, uh, so what happens when there's diffusion limited, right? Uh, so again, there's uh, this thing here, right? Uh, so, oh, we're talking about carbon monoxide. Okay, never mind. Uh, now we're talking about the carbon monoxide. So basically, uh, there's a steady increase, right? So if you're giving, say, 100% of carbon monoxide, for example, CO. Okay, uh, remember that's dangerous. To inhale but if we give that uh, to check with uh, for diffusion defects uh, there will be 100% uh, increase in a normal patient of carbon monoxide and the basically saturation of uh, carbon monoxide in the cell will get picked up when you check for it however if there is uh, some kind of you know fibrosis or something over here then it's going to have a hard time getting diffused into the cell right it's going to get blocked here so if you're giving 100 percent and you don't see a hundred percent rise uh, right it's an exponential uh, sorry it's a steady state rise or not steady state but just a linear rise of carbon monoxide and if you don't see that that means there's something wrong and there is diffusion uh, pathology so that's basically it for that. Uh, PA is partial pressure of gas in the pulmonary capillary. Okay, and then PA, partial pressure of gas in the alveolar air. So this is the alveolar air. That's the air that comes in when you breathe, and this is the partial pressure inside of the esophagus as well. Uh, pulmonary vascular resistance, that's PVR equals uh, the pulmonary artery so how much is going out like aorta subtract uh, okay pulmonary artery subtract the pressure so that's pressure in pulmonary artery oh sorry so that's the one that comes in from the left ventricle uh, right ventricle okay so you have that's right atrium ra uh, this is the right ventricle uh, you have left atrium and left ventricle and this goes to the lungs and then so this is the pulmonary artery and then the pulmonary vein comes into the uh, left atrium right so left atrium pulmonary artery occlusion pressure okay so we're looking at how much pressure was in this and subtract uh, the uh, this pressure in uh, the pulmonary vein or you know pulmonary wedge capillary pressure or whatever pulmonary capillary wedge pressure uh, subtract that and divide it by q which is the cardiac output because that's how much is gonna that's probably probably what's gonna determine the pressure in this right yes okay so that's the formula uh, it's an easy formula so remember it uh, what is more important is this one. We already talked about this in some other place. Okay. 
for viscosity and all that. So resistance is equal to whatever this is, but normally they'll have a capillary that's cut into half, right? Uh, they clamped it down, so instead of this, it's this big now by half. So then how do you account for that? So resistance is equal to this over this. So if uh, initially it was at 100%, then we know that R at first was 1 over 1, which is 1, which is 100%, right? But resistance is equal to this, and they only give you the diameter, so that's the only thing we care about, so R to the power of 4. And since now it's cut in half, 0 0.1, right? So you replace this one with 0 0.1. The R is equal to 0 0.5, sorry, not 1. 0 0.5 because it's half to the power of 4. So 1 over 0 0.5 to the power of 4 is equal to 16. And that's how you get that answer. Okay. Uh, so this is also called, oh, they're giving it right here, the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. Right, so pulmonary artery occlusion pressure. Okay. Uh, now we're on to ventilation perfusion mismatch. Uh, ideally, ventilation is matched to perfusion per minute. That is uh, V over Q ratio with equal to 1, right? And Q was uh, cardiac output or the flow or perfusion. Uh, for adequate gas exchange lung zones are okay so you have lungs here right this is a lung this is the apex this is the middle part and this is the base or the lower part of the lung right uh, this one is considered uh, wasted ventilation why because there is more ventilation happening wait let me just make sure that I'm right Yeah, so alveolar air, there's more over here compared to this. Okay, I think I'm right, so we'll just do that. So, because TB comes here, right? That's where you find it after, when it's activated again, secondary activation. That's because they are aerobic and they like, uh, you know, aerobic areas. So they go up here after they have infiltrated over here creating the gone spoke fits and all that. So this is the ventilation. So it's wasted ventilation because there is a lot of air coming in, but there's not that much, that many capillaries that are taking, uh, they're benefiting from it, right? Or taking advantage of it. So that's why there's ventilation, but since it's not being perfused, it's called wasted ventilation. Similarly, this is called uh, wasted perfusion because this is filled with capillaries. However, uh, there's not as much uh, ventilation happening here in a normal physiologic state, right? Why did I say normal physiologic stage? Because when you're exercising or something like that, uh, the ratio for ventilation to perfusion is equal to 1 over here and over here, okay? Uh, normally, it's equal to 1 in this area in the middle part, so you have equal amount of ventilation to perfusion in the middle okay so if there's if there is any difference between that it's called ventilation perfusion mismatch and that's it okay uh, so let's see ideally ventilation is smashed to perfusion so before we go on let me just make sure you understand so if you have uh, a capillary here right which is on into this and this and this okay and say you have a thrombus right or embolism coming in and then it's stuck over here okay so what's gonna happen to this alveoli uh, right uh, is it getting ventilated? Yes, it is, right? 
because um, air is still going to come and inflate this alveoli. Is it getting perfused? No, because the thrombus is blocking this perfusion uh, from blood coming in, so it's not perfused. So this is causing increase in ventilation but decrease in uh, perfusion, right? So that's a ventilation perfusion mismatch, okay? And usually this is going to come in a pulmonary embolism case anyway, so that's what this means. So if it's decreased here, what's going to happen? Uh, these vessels are going to uh, eventually vasoconstrict because this area, part of the area, is not getting perfused. So the brain is going to vasoconstrict this, increasing the, the resistance. And then so the blood gets diverted into like the other ones that are well perfused. Okay. Ideally, ventilation uh, is smashed to perfusion per minute. That is BQ ratio is equal to one for adequate gas exchange. That's ideal state. Lung zones are uh, VQ at apex of lungs is three. This is called wasted ventilation. That's what I was looking for. Okay. Uh, so there's increased amount in the VQ uh, V, but decrease in Q. Okay. So. Since it's not going to be exchanged, uh, there will be buildup, so eventually it's going to slow down. However, so that causes a decrease in ventilation. However, there is a severe decrease in perfusion, which is going to cause an increase, right? If you have, uh, say you started with 1 over 1, right, uh, which is equal to 1, then you have 0 0.9 divided by 0. I don't know, let's say 3 right so that's 3 over 1 okay uh, ratio so that's still 3 right and that's the ratio that you have okay increase in uh, that's why there's an increase in ventilation perfusion mismatch that's this is the number that decides if it's an increase or decrease in ventilation perfusion mismatch okay so that's why it's uh, and I already explained why it's called ventilation uh, wasted ventilation is because it's not highly perfused as it is uh, in the lower parts so this was about apex and in the at the base uh, so this area it's called wasted perfusion because the ratio here is 0 0.6 why because there is an increase in ventilation Right, so you have say from one it's gone to two, and over here you have severe increase in perfusion. So say like one, six, right? So two over six, one over three is the ratio now, right? Which is a decrease compared to uh, this, right? Thirty-three point, how much is it? Yeah, so 33% decrease uh, or 0.33, okay? So that's a decrease and that's how you get decrease in perfusion, uh, ventilation perfusion, okay? Both ventilation and perfusion are greater at the base of the lung that than at apex of the lung. With exercise uh, increase in cardiac output, there is vasodilation of apical capillaries okay uh, so this leads to uh, ventilation perfusion ratio approaching one okay since when again so when you're exercising these uh, dilate right they dilate more to increase the blood flow to the uh, where it was previously highly resistant right so that will bring it closer to this uh, to one and even similarly here, it's going to uh, ventilate more, I guess, because you're breathing faster and during exercise. So that will also approach to one. Okay. Uh, certain organisms that thrive in high O2, uh, for example, TB, 
flourish in the apex okay so that's why you find pb over there because they like the aerobic environment uh when vq is equal to zero okay so when do you get zero when one of them is zero i guess right uh, the airway obstruction okay so when it's the top number that's zero so airway obstruction shunt and shunt 100 percent o2 does not improve uh partial pressure of oxygen in the arteries or capillaries for example foreign body sorry uh, foreign body aspiration right so you have trachea over here right and say the bronchioles right that's a bronchial just go with it and that's the alveoli Uh, so this is the uh, foreign body coming in and then it's usually on the right side so just think of this that's the right side uh, it could be any side actually but normally when they're talking about foreign body coming in it's gonna be on the right side okay uh, but usually this is the right side so Okay, so uh, it comes in and blocks that. Okay, so then the uh, V is going to be zero because there is no ventilation happening anymore, right? And then uh, perfusion is still there. So anything, uh, when you have a numerator that's a zero divided by anything is still going to be a zero, right? If there's zero pizza and you divide it by an eight, you still have zero pizzas, right? So airway obstruction shunt. In shunt 100%. So when you give 100% oxygen, uh, it's not going to improve this, right? So say the foreign body is, I guess they're talking about this. The foreign body is right here. So it's blocking complete, uh, complete ventilation. So when you put in 100% oxygen uh, via tube or anything, uh, sorry, face mask, uh, it's not going to get ventilated. So that's what they're talk talking about. For example, for body aspiration. Then you have VQ, uh, where the perfusion is at zero, right? Uh, because of... So let's make capillary in there. Okay, and then and pulmonary embolism happened, right? So that happened and then you don't have anything there so blood flow obstruction physiologic dead space that's what it is because there's no exchange happening here assuming less than 100 percent dead space 100 percent of o2 improves pao2 for example pulmonary embolism okay so what they're saying is, uh, even though this is 100%, uh, there are other capillaries, right? Or other alveoli. So this is one. Usually in an example, they'll have three. So two of them will be perfused and one of them is not. Or one of them is perfused and the other two are not because of that. So anyhow, any case, in any case, uh, if you give 100% oxygen, it's still going to improve the condition. Okay? Because... The, there are still some capillaries where the exchange is happening. So that's what they're saying. So if you give 100% oxygen and it's improving, that means the problem is here in the capillaries. There is a physiologic dead space. There's an, uh, It's probably pulmonary embolism. But if you're giving 100% and it's not happening, the problem is with the ventilation. Okay, And that's how you uh, figure that out. Alveolar gas equation. Okay, so partial pressure of oxygen in airways uh, is equal to. Sorry, no, that's alveolar. Okay, I thought that was. Okay, whatever. So big A is alveolar uh, partial pressure, and then the small a is the arterial. Okay, yeah, never mind. So that is the airway one. 
Okay. So partial pressure of alveolar, we can figure that out with uh, the inspired oxygen, uh, oxygen in the inspired air. Subtract the carbon dioxide divided by the respiratory quotient, or RQ. Right. Uh, this is the formula you need to remember for this. Uh, you don't have to worry about this. Uh, if they ask you uh, how much oxygen is in the alveolar, alveoli, this I've figured it out. 150, subtract uh, whatever uh, partial pressure of carbon dioxide they give you and divide it by 0 0.8. Okay. Uh, why is this important? Because, okay, so this is at sea level breathing room air. Okay. Why is this important? Because there is something called AA gradient. That's the alveolar air and the partial pressure and the capillary and the gradient between them so when you do PaO2 minus uh, so alveolar oxygen minus the arterial oxygen you get the AA gradient and this is why you need to figure out how to get this they'll probably give you this right but they won't give you this so then you have to figure it out okay uh, so after you figure it out, you subtract the partial pressure of oxygen in the arteries, and then uh, you see if the normal AA gradient is estimated as uh, H divided by 4 plus 4. You need to remember this. This is how you figure out these questions, and you need this for that. So if it's a normal AA gradient, that means there is no diffusion-related problems. Okay, uh, it's something else. But if there is, uh, so for example, a person is less than 40 years old, gradient should be less than 40, 14, right? Because 40 divided by 4 plus 4, so 40 divided by 4 is 10 plus 4 is 14, so the gradient should be less than 14. A normal one. So if it was higher than this, uh, that means there is a, a gradient is increased, so there is perfusion ventilation defect somewhere. Okay, uh, this is very important to remember, and this is also important because that's how you figure out what the this is, PaO2. So when you figure this out, you can plug it in here. Uh, sorry, when you uh, figure this out, uh, you can plug it in here, and then you. Get your AA gradient. So if there is a uh, AA gradient increase, that means there is ventilation perfusion mismatch. Okay, that's another way to figure it out as well. Because uh, why would there be a mismatch? If the air is here and the partial pressure is increased here, but then you don't see that in the capillary, that means there's something wrong in the middle, right? Like fibrosis. Okay, or it could be that the uh, perfusion is not happening over here or there's a foreign body it could be anything but there will be a gradient difference okay uh, carbon dioxide transport so there are three ways uh, we transport carbon dioxide okay uh, carbon dioxide is transported from tissue and to lungs in three forms uh, one is bicarbonate uh, this is 70 percent of it uh, HCO3 and C uh, Bicarbonate and chloride transporter on RBCs. So that the this one. Uh, so bicarbonate and chloride transporter on RBC membrane allows bicarbonate to diffuse uh, out to the plasma and chloride to diffuse into the RBC. This is called the chloride shift by a facilitated uh, diffusion counter transport. Okay, since they this these are the ones that determine the negative polarity of your blood or like you know these are negative ions so if one negative ion is going out there should be another negative ion coming in just like if there's potassium potassium a positive ion going out uh, sodium ion comes in or calcium goes out and sodium comes in or if calcium comes in potassium goes out you know there's always balance there's equilibrium just like Thanos wanted it uh, so, yeah, that's one way. Second way is carbaminohemoglobin. Uh, 
carb amino hemoglobin or HbCO2, 21 to 25%. CO2 bound to hemoglobin at end terminus of globin, not heme. Carbon dioxide favors deoxygenated form, O2 unloaded. Dissolved CO2 uh, by 10%. That's the third way. Okay. So uh, HbCO2, that's this one. Right, it gets transported like this uh, with the hemoglobin, and it's called carb amino hemoglobin. The carbon dioxide is bound to hemoglobin at the end terminus. This is important to remember. Uh, end terminus of the globin, but not the heme. Okay. Uh, carbon dioxide favors deoxygenated form, so O2 unloaded. Okay, that comes with the right and left shift that we'll talk about right here about the unloading and all that and then the third one is that it just dissolved in the plasma right the partial pressure of carbon dioxide that's what it determines in lungs oxygenation of hemoglobin promotes dissociation of H plus ions from hemoglobin right so when it's in the lungs Oxygena oxygenation, when oxygen come in and binds to the uh, heme groups on hemoglobin, it promotes uh, release of H ions from the hemoglobin. This shifts the equilibrium towards carbon dioxide formation, right? Because when oxygen comes in, H uh, leaves, right? So, yeah, so there's H on the hemoglobin, then it gets split when oxygen comes, right? So let's make O2. O2 right? So it comes in uh, and it splits the H ion. So then the H with the carbon, uh, sorry, bicarbonate, it combines to make H2CO3 and then with the carbonic anhydrase, it makes uh, CO2 and H2O and that's how you get the CO2, right? Uh, in the lungs and that's how you do that. In lungs, oxygenation of hemoglobin promotes dissociation of H from HB. This shifts equilibrium towards carbon dioxide formation. Therefore, carbon dioxide is released from RPCs. Uh, this is called the Haldane effect. Okay, and it's important that you understand this concept. Majority of blood, carbon dioxide is carried as bicarbonate in the plasma. Okay, hypoxia and hypoxemia. Hypoxia, there's decrease of oxygen. Okay, so what's the difference between the two? Just by looking at the word, we know emia is in the blood. So oxygen in the blood is hypo, right? And then uh, hypoxia is blood. There is decreased amount of oxygen reaching the tissues, or oxygenating the tissues, or organs. Right. So hypoxia is decrease in O2 delivery to tissue, commonly due to decrease in cardiac output. Okay. So that's one reason. Hypoxemia. It could be a reason. Ischemia is a reason. Anemia is a reason. Carbon monoxide, cyanide poisoning is the reason and mechanism of, okay, right? So then there's a mechanism of hypoxia with a normal AA gradient. So there's no problem with the diffusion and uh, perfusion and all that, right? Uh, there's no problem with that. So what, when you have normal AA gradient, what causes hypoxia? There's decreased inspired oxygen tension Okay, so the air that you're breathing in, like high altitude, doesn't have enough oxygen. Okay, so in partial pressure of oxygen in the inspired air is equal to FiO2 by this and this. So most commonly due to decrease in uh, partial pressure of whatever PB is and high altitude. Okay, just understand the concept. They're not going to test you on this formula. Hypoventilation due to increased uh, partial pressure of carbon dioxide. So 
that's equal to this and this and this. Uh, it happens in CNS depression, right? Because then you have a uh, carbon dioxide buildup. Because what does CNS depression do? It depresses respiration as well. So basically, how does that happen? It your respiratory muscles don't know what to do without the signals from the brain coming in. So it's not gonna inflate or deflate or anything. It's just gonna stay still, and that's why it causes respiration. So that's like intercostal muscles, your diaphragm, your axillary muscles, and all that stuff, right? Uh, oh, so another place is uh, another thing that can cause this or hypoventilation uh, is obesity, hypoventilation syndrome. It's because the fat buildup is too heavy on a, for your body to put in the effort on its own to you know, overcome the inertia or muscular weakness like myasthenia gravis or something like that or MS or actually that's autoimmune so I don't think that would apply here but anything that would you know like polio or something that causes depression or like muscular weakness right? all of that will cause hypoventilation and increase in uh, partial pressure of carbon dioxide Okay, so this was a uh, normal AA gradient. So what happens when there is something wrong over here? So what are the things that can go wrong? There's diffusion limitation, the cement one, right? So that's fibrosis. There's uh, ventilation perfusion mismatch. So with normal perfusion in areas of decreased ventilation. Okay, so foreign body and the trachea. Or it could be, you know, pulmonary embolism, so for a thrombus here, so normal ventilation but decreased perfusion. Right to left shunt, that's normal perfusion in areas of no ventilation. Okay, so you have normal but no ventilation, so this is a right to left shunt. It can be uh, anatomic, for example, intracardiac shunt or physiologic, for example, perfusion of non-ventilated alveoli in ARDS, okay. ARDS causes right to left shunt and this causes intracardiac shunting. Okay, so what is right to left shunt? Just so you know, it basically skips the, what is right to left shunt? I think it's the one where it skips the lungs and it goes straight into the aorta instead. Okay, so the perfusion, oh, the perfusion is normal, so that's not it. Oh, I think they're talking about this. It goes from right to left shunt. Or I'm actually not too sure about that one. So I'll be moving on. Hemoglobin, uh, so it has uh, adult hemoglobin is uh, A2, B2, right? So two alphas, two betas. Uh, normal adult hemoglobin is composed of four polypeptide subunits, two alphas, two betas that each bind one O2 molecule. Uh, hemoglobin is an allosteric protein that exhibits positive cooperative uh, when binding to O2 such that this is what I was talking about right uh, see this is oxygen right so uh, oxygenation oxygenated hemoglobin has high affinity uh, for O2 right so if there's all of these are on it that means uh, it's really, you know, has a high affinity for O2, 300 times, okay? If it's oxygenated. So the, these are oxygenated. How do we know they're oxygenated? Because they're red. Okay. Red, 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 red. Okay. Uh, 
oxygenated hemoglobin has high affinity for O2. Then uh, next point is deoxygenated hemoglobin has low affinity for O2. Okay, so if these are deoxygenated, oops. right now they're deoxygenated. Uh, they don't have uh, they have a low affinity for O2 right so they're not going to once they release O2 right that's O2 once they release O2 they're, they don't want it to attach again right so that's why the affinity lowers once it's released okay? so it promotes release and unloading of O2 deoxygenated hemoglobin uh, the protein component of Okay, so what they were saying over here, the cooperativity, that's just basically the oxygen when it comes in. Uh, the first one that gets, you know, remember with the capillary, uh, before it even reaches the end, it's already uh, between this and this, it reaches equilibrium, right, a steady state. Uh, that's because as soon as this one comes in, it uh, causes an increase in affinity for another oxygenated uh, oxygen molecule, which increases uh, affinity for this one. And then by the time this comes in, there's affinity up to 300 times more than it was with the, just the first one. Okay. Uh, so the protein component of hemoglobin acts as a buffer for H ions. Okay. That's just something you for you to note. Myoglobin is composed of single polypeptide chain associated with one hemoity. Higher affinity for oxygen than hemoglobin. Okay, so basically when it reaches uh, the skeletal muscle, right, this, uh, then the, this skeletal muscle has the affinity. It only has um, one single polypeptide and it's called myoglobin right so myoglobin has the highest affinity affinity for oxygen even more than this one right and that's why it's able to pull off the oxygen uh, from the hemoglobin into this uh, myoglobin okay and as soon as that happens the affinity for oxygen decreases because now here it's uh, deoxygenated right so when uh, that happens uh, hemoglobin has low affinity for O2 so it promotes release and unloading of more so this will go again go into another myoglobin easier and this will be easily unloaded to another myoglobin and similarly this one as well okay so uh, the graph if you were to draw a graph this is what the graph would look like uh, for myoglobin this red li uh, gray line okay over here there is increase right here there's one uh, hemoglobin oxygen uh, oxygenated second one uh, and like third one and then by uh, and it reaches to the fourth one here and it then it's just smooth sailing for there right but over here it exponential growth right not even exponential it's like immediate growth for uh, myoglobin getting oxygenated because since it's only single polypeptide it just needs one oxygen so as soon as it's uh, loaded up it reaches equilibrium there okay so that's what this graph is for myoglobin at least oxygen content of blood there's O2 content which equals to O2 bound to hemoglobin plus O2 solubilized in the plasma this is equal to 1.34 times hemoglobin times saturated oxygen plus uh, 0 0.003 times partial pressure of oxygen. Saturated oxygen is percent saturation of arterial blood with oxygen, right? So how much oxygen is in the blood? 0 0.003 is equal to solubility, a constant of O2. Uh, 
and PaO2 is partial pressure of oxygen in arterial blood. Normally, one gram of hemoglobin can bind to 1.34 milliliter of oxygen. Okay, so one gram of hemoglobin can bind to this much. So normal hemoglobin amount in blood is 15 grams per deciliter. O2 binding carrying capacity is around 20 ml O2 deciliter of blood. Uh, with decrease in hemoglobin, there is increase in oxygen content of arterial blood, but no change in O2 saturation and partial pressure of oxygen. O2 delivery to tissue is equal to cardiac output times O2 content of the blood. Okay. Uh, let's see if we can figure this out without... at it okay so in carbon monoxide poisoning the hemoglobin concentration is uh, gonna be the same right so hold on. So that's going to be normal, right? Okay, uh, and uh, saturation of oxygen, it's going to be less, right? Because uh, carbon monoxide is going to take its place, right? Uh, so decrease uh, competes with O2. And then partial pressure of oxygen Solubil it's still there's still oxygen in the blood so that's going to be normal right uh, then you have total o2 content is decreased right because o2 content is based on how much it's bound to hemoglobin plus how much it's solubilized in the plasma so it should be decreased okay makes sense anemia hemoglobin concentration that's the definition of anemia, right? It's going to be decreased. Uh, saturation of oxygen, uh, even though this is decreased, all of its hemoglobin is still going to be saturated with oxygen, so that's going to be normal. Uh, partial pressure of oxygen is also normal, right? Because that's uh, hemoglobin doesn't affect how much oxygen is in the capillaries. What does? The AA gradient, right? Uh, then total O2 content, uh, that's decreased, right? Because there's decrease in amount of hemoglobin, uh, which binds the O2, so should be decreased, yeah. Uh, polycythemia, uh, this is increase in hemoglobin concentration because there's increase in cells that contain hemoglobin, so it should be increased. Saturation of oxygen should be normal because all of the hemoglobins are still being saturated normally uh, partial pressure of oxygen again it doesn't affect that so normal uh, total O2 content now since this is increased uh, the O2 content is increased as well right yeah okay then you have met these questions we need to know what methemoglobin is uh, methemoglobin is just uh, Fe and uh, Fe3 form so when Fe2 it converts to Fe3 and you get methemoglobin. Why is this important? It's because Fe3 plus does not bind oxygen. Okay. Uh, oxygen binds to only the Fe2 plus. Okay. Uh, hemoglobin. This would be the antidote. Uh, you give methylene blue and methemoglobin. Methylet. Okay. So uh, hemoglobin concentration is still the same. So it's normal. Uh, saturation of oxygen. So oxygen on the hemoglobin, it's not going to combine, bind to it, right? So saturation is going to decrease. Because Fe3 plus poor binding at uh, binding O2. Partial pressure of oxygen is going to be the same. Normal. 
right and total o2 content now since the there is no o2 bound to hemoglobin or there's decrease so total o2 content should be decreased as well then you have cyanide toxicity uh, hemoglobin concentration is uh, going to be the same so it's normal right uh, saturation of oxygen uh, that's going to be cyanide toxicity what happens to oxygen in that I think it's going to decrease right or is it where oxygen uh, definitive oxygen is increased it should be decreased I'm gonna guess it's decreased no it's normal okay so it doesn't affect the saturation of oxygen because cyanide affects the mitochondria not the hemoglobin right so partial pressure of oxygen is going to be the same normal and total O2 content is going to be the same normal normal yeah okay so normal hemoglobin normal saturation partial pressure of oxygen and total to content is all everything is normal and cyanide toxicity the problem is with the decouplers in the electron transport chain right uh, it uh, basically messes that up so you don't get ATP and you lose the hydrogen ions or something like that oxygen dissociation curve shifts in oxy hemoglobin dissociation curve ODC reflect local tissue oxygen needs it can be helpful meets metabolic needs or harmful in toxicities or pathologic pathophysiologic condition uh, situations so if there's a right shift uh, the right shift is ODC reflects decrease in hemoglobin affinity for O2. So this is what we want, ideally, right? A right shift. Uh, you want the oxygen to, you know, get unloaded to the tissues and places where it's needed. So you don't want hemoglobin to, you know, carry it with it uh, back to the lungs when it comes back. So there is increased O2 unloading at tissues. Physiologically occurs with increase in O2 needs like exercise or decrease in pH. Why decrease in pH? Because when you exercise, you create lactic acidosis as well, right? A little bit of a lactic acid that also causes pH, so you can remember it that way. But yeah, uh, so that uh, and. So basically, it's increase in uh, H ions. You can remember it that way. So increase in H ion, increase in temperature, uh, increase in uh, CO2, right? Uh, increase in 2,3 ppg at the cellular level caused by increase in H and increase in CO2. So everything that increases will cause uh, right shift, okay? It's created by the tissue metabolism. Uh, it's called the Bohr effect. Uh, then left shift in uh, oxy oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve reflect, reflects uh, increase in hemoglobin affinity. So over here, they don't want to uh, they don't want to get rid of the oxygen in these situations. Okay, so, uh, for O2, so there's reduced or decreased O2 unloading at tissues. Physiologically, it occurs with decrease in O2 needs like decrease in temperature and pregnancy right uh, fetal hemoglobin has a higher o2 affinity than hemoglobin adult hemoglobin and this leads to increase in o2 binding due to decrease affinity for 2,3 bpg and this is a left shift and driving o2 across the placenta to fetus uh, uh, pathologically, it occurs with increase in carbon monoxide and increase in meth hemoglobin. Okay, so carbon monoxide and meth hemoglobin. That's FP3. Okay. Uh, okay. And uh, genetic mutations as well, like decreasing 2,3 BPG. Uh, left is lower. 
so everything is lower with this lower temperature uh, then there was what else uh, lower 2 BP uh, 2 3 BPG uh, decrease in uh, CO2 or decrease in O2 not yeah decrease in O2 okay not decrease in O2 decrease in CO2 right okay and if there's an increase in carbon monoxide and increase in methemoglobin so this is the one you gotta remember for left shifts okay so you have venous blood dis deoxygenated right and arterial blood that's oxygenated. The oxygenated blood will have complete uh, oxygen uh, saturation. And over here, the saturation is uh, zero with the, or like, you know, it's reduced uh, in venous blood. And then it becomes oxygenated. As it becomes oxygenated, it's going to have increased amount of oxygen bound to it. So, ODC has sigmoidal shape due to positive cooperativity that is tetrameric hemoglobin uh, molecules so four hemoglobin molecules which can bind to four oxygen molecules and has higher affinity for each subsequent O2 molecule bound so as it binds to it uh, and increases in number there's increase in affinity as well myoglobin is monomeric so there's only one and thus does not show positive cooperativity. Uh, curve lacks sigmoidal appearance. That's the reason. As soon as it's uh, oxygenated, it's uh, done. Response to high altitude. So constant uh, FiO2, but decrease in PV will lead to decrease in atmospheric pressure. Uh, sorry, atmospheric oxygen. What was PV again? Right, so atmospheric pressure called zero. Okay. So constant uh, FiO2, uh, but decrease in atmospheric pressure. This leads to decrease in atmospheric oxygen, which leads to decrease in partial pressure of oxygen in the arteries. So uh, to compensate that, you will hyperventilate or increase in ventilation. Uh, this causes carbon washout, so decrease in partial pressure of uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, this leads to respiratory alkalosis, right, because uh, CO2 uh, is what you look at for respiratory acidosis or alkalosis. And for metabolic acidosis, alkalosis, you look at bicarbonates, right. So do that in renal the anion gap and all that stuff okay so respiratory alkalosis it leads to altitude sickness headache nausea fatigue lightheadedness sleep disturbance chronic increase in ventilation increase in uh, so that's what it will be there will be increase in erythropoietin as well to increase the hematocrit and hemoglobin due to chronic hypoxia there will be uh, increase in 2,3 BPG so it binds to hemoglobin, rightward shift of oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve because you want oxygen to release as soon as it reaches those sites where it's required, right? So you don't want to hold on to it. And also uh, during hypoxic states, uh, you have increase in 2,3-BPG because that also produces ATP. Okay, increase in O2 release. Cellular changes, there's increase in mitochondria, uh, increase in renal excretion of bicarbonate to compensate for respiratory alkalosis, can augment with acetazolamide. Uh, acetazolamide makes, uh, helps make uh, your urine acidic. No, sorry, it causes metabolic acidosis. I think that's the side effect of that. So you can use acetazolamide like that. Uh, chronic hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction will lead to increase in pulmonary vascular resistance. This leads to pulmonary hypertension and right ventricular hypertrophy. Cool. 
know these uh, it's uh, important I give response to exercise increase in heart rate and increase in stroke volume will lead to increase in cardiac output uh, or perfusion uh, which will lead to increase in pulmonary blood flow which leads to increase in the ventilation perfusion ratio from base to apex becoming more uniform equal to one increase in cellular respiration will lead to increase in carbon dioxide production and decrease in pH at tissues this leads to right shift of uh, oxygen dissociation curve and so tissue offloading of more O2 uh, will lead to increase in O2 consumption. Increase in RR to meet the increase in O2 demand and remove excess uh, waste, which is carbon dioxide. Uh, partial pressure of oxygen and partial pressure of carbon dioxide are maintained by hemostatic mechanisms. Uh, decrease in uh, um, uh, ventilated oxygen due to increase in O2 Okay, so pulmonary vein is oxygen due to pulmonary vein oxygen due to increase in O2 consumption and increase in PVO2, PCBCO2 due to increase in CO2 production. Okay. Uh, all of this makes sense. Not really sure what the P with the line is, but I'm sure it's not that complicated. Methemoglobin. Iron and hemoglobin is just uh, normally in a reduced form, ferrous, you know, just the two of us, so ferrous form. Oxidized form of hemoglobin is ferric or Fe3, uh, which does not bind O2 as readily as Fe2, but has increased affinity for cyanide. Okay, uh, we actually give this in cyanide poisoning. Uh, so, uh, since uh, it has an increased affinity for cyanide okay right okay uh, so it causes uh, tissue hypoxia from decrease in o2 saturation and decrease in o2 content uh, this fe3 form is called methemoglobinemia while typical concentrations are one to two percent methemoglobinemia it will occur at higher levels and may present with cyanosis does not improve with supplemental O2 and with chocolate colored blood. Dapsone, local aesthetics, for example, benzocaine and nitrates, for example, from dietary intake or polluted water source can po uh, cause poisoning by oxidizing Fe2 plus to Fe3 plus, right? So it's going to be something about uh, a person who was hiking in the mountains and there he became thirsty so he started drinking water from a pool up there and uh, water sources up high uh, in the mountains it can contain nitrates okay uh, and that will cause the conversion of Fe2 plus to Fe3 plus and you get methemoglobinemia with that okay Dapson can cause this and local anesthetics like benzocaine as well Methemoglobinemia can be treated with methylene blue and vitamin C. Okay, uh, this is important to remember, vitamin C. You'll remember methylene blue because there's meth in it and methemoglobin has meth in it as well. So meth and meth goes together, but they won't give you this in the option. They were like, along with this, what another ancillary treatment would you give? And you would give vitamin C. Okay. Uh, how would you figure out is this? It has chocolate colored blood. The chocolate color comes from, you know, lack of oxygen and hemoglobin. That gives you this. Okay. And yeah, so it does not improve with supplemental oxygen. So you give oxygen, but it does not improve. Well, when would it improve? In carbon monoxide, it, uh, you give supplemental oxygen and the condition improves, but not with this. Okay, so cyanide versus carbon monoxide poisoning. Both inhibit aerobic metabolism via inhibition of complex uh, 4 on ETC, right? That's electron transport chain, cytochrome C oxidase. 
uh, hypoxia that does not fully correct with supplemental O2. Okay, it's not going to fully correct with supplemental O2. And increase in anaerobic metabolism happens. So in cyanide, the exposure comes from synthetic product, combustion, amygdalin ingestion from found in the apricot seeds, cyanide ingestion in suicide attempts, and fire victims. Okay. Uh, presentation, headache, dyspnea, drowsiness, seizures, coma, may have cherry red skin. This is the buzzword, cherry red skin. Uh, breath may have a bitter almond odor. That's also a buzzword. Labs, uh, normal PO2, uh, elevated lactate will lead to anion gap metabolic acidosis right because you're not making any ATP so now you have to do it through the NAD and NADPH to make uh, ATP so that's going to create more lactate which causes increased uh, anion or anion gap metabolic acidosis okay uh, effect on oxygen hemoglobin curve the curve is normal oxygen saturation may appear normal initially despite ample O2 supply it cannot be used due to ineffective oxidative phosphorylation treatment is decontamination for example remove clothes hydroxycobalamin this is important it binds cyanide uh, cyanocobalamin uh, that leads to renal excretion you give nitrates, this is the methemoglobin, uh, to make methemoglobin, because cyanide then comes and attaches to methemoglobin, right? Uh, so you have cyanide co coming out of the mitochondria from the ETC, so it's not going to, you know, damage it any further. And then we uh, take care of that uh, by filtering it out. So it binds cyanide and cyanomethemoglobin, so it decreases or uh, reduces toxicity. Sodium thiosulfate. Uh, increase in cyanide conversion to thiocyanate, uh, which leads to renal excretion. So it makes it water soluble. Sodium thiosulfate. So you have three things you can give in uh, cyanide poisoning. Hydroxycobalamin. Uh, this has a similar action as sodium thiosulfate. They both uh, convert it into water soluble compound, so it can get renally excreted. And nitrates to because uh, we just learned that it has an increased affinity for cyanide, right? Okay. Uh, so now on to carbon monoxide. Uh, exposure is from motor exhaust, gas heater, or fire victim. Okay, so it's usually going to, uh, the question stands going to be about someone, a family who ran out of power, so they had to turn on the furnace or heater. That, and... Uh, in the morning, everyone was found cyanosed or like, you know, they had cherry red skin and all that stuff, okay? Uh, so it could be cyanide or this. You got to differentiate between the two because uh, it does happen in fire victims as well. And that's, it gets confusing like that. Uh, and this one also has cherry red skin. So headache, vomiting, confusion, visual disturbances, and coma. Chances are this is going to happen to more than one person uh, in a family and this only happens to a person, individual. Um, may have cherry red skin with bulbous skin lesions. Multiple vitamins may be involved, for example, family due to faulty furnace. Right, that's going to be the question stem. Uh, lab, uh, you have normal uh, partial pressure of oxygen. Elevated carboxyhemoglobin on cooximetry. Classically uh, associated with bilateral globus pallidus uh, lesions on MRI. Okay, it's always this area, the globus pallidus or basal ganglia here and there. Right. So, if you see this, then it's going to be carbon dioxide uh, monoxide poisoning. Because where does cyanide go? It goes into the mitochondria. It won't affect this. But carbon monoxide, it rises up. The gas rises up to the roof. Right. So. Uh, rises up to the head uh, remember it that way uh, okay uh, although can rarely be seen with cyanide toxicity uh, 
we can just ignore that because they don't make that distinction. Effect on oxygen hemoglobin curve, it's going to cause a left shift, right? Uh, left shift, uh, so it goes this way, so that's left shift. So it doesn't want to get rid of the oxygen, right? So there's an increased affinity for oxygen, decrease, uh, causing decreased oxygen unloading in tissues. It binds competitively to a hemoglobin with more than 200 times greater affinity than oxygen to form carboxyhemoglobin and uh, decrease in percentage oxygen saturation of hemoglobin. So if this one is binding to, uh, if carbon monoxide is binding to the hemoglobin, then how is oxygen affinity increasing? Right? Uh, if there is no oxygen there binding to the hemoglobin. It's because this one is actually, you know, since there is no oxygen on the hemoglobin, it's not going to be unloading in the tissues. Right? There is nothing, no oxygen to unload in the tissues. So that's why it's a left shift. Okay. Uh, treatment, 100% O2. Hyperbaric oxygen is severe. Okay, that's the treatment and 100% uh, supplemental oxygen is also part of that. Okay, uh, O2 bound to hemoglobin, uh, MLO2 for this, and partial pressure of oxygen. So you, uh, normally it's like this, okay, uh, but with uh, oxygen, uh, sorry, carboxyhemoglobin, uh, the O2 bound to hemoglobin reduces by half, right? And in anemia, it's not about the binding that's a problem. So it's a sigmoid. It's just that there's not enough hemoglobin uh, to compensate for the workload. Okay. And that's all. Rhinus sinusitis. Uh, this is an obstruction of sinus drainage into the nasal cavity. Inflammation and pain over affected area typically affects maxillary sinuses, which drain against gravity due to ostia located superomedially. Red arrow points to fluid-filled right maxillary sinus in A. Right, so right there. Superior meatus drains posterior ethmoid. Uh, okay, let's draw those sinuses and then so it typically affects the maxillary sinus. So if this is a skull, this is the skull, right? So maxillary sinus would be right here, right? That one right there. Uh, which drains against gravity, right? So it's, uh, if you have, look at it from the side, this is what it's going to look like, right? So this part is, has to go up here and then drain out. So that's why it's called against the gravity. Due to ostia located superomedially, right? Uh, red arrow points to fluid-filled right maxillary sinus in a superior meatus drains, so that would be the this part right here, the meatus, uh, drains posterior ethmoid, middle meatus drains frontal, and maxillary and anterior ethmoid drain the inferior one. So we have superior, middle, and inferior meatus, right? Uh, they are going to get drained, so the superior one gets drained by Uh, drains posterior uh, ethmoid. Okay, so this one is gonna drain posterior ethmoid. Okay. 
Uh, that's the superior meters. Uh, middle meatus drains frontal, maxillary, and anterior ethmoid. Right. Frontal sinus, maxillary sinus, and it's me this way. Is the middle. And the uh, inferior mutus drains nasal lacrimal duct. Okay. So to make sure what uh, these, to remember these, uh, we need to know where the sinuses are, right? So. Okay, so that would be the maxillary, that would be the same thing, sphenoid. Uh, this is maxillary, this is the nasal cavity. These are the ethmoids over here, right? And then this is the frontal sinus. Okay, see if there's any more. So let's just do this. Uh, nasal lacrimal goes from the tear duct to the uh, nose, right? Okay. It's in the name, uh, nose to the lacrimal duct. Okay, uh, so that's the inferior one, uh, right? That drains it. And then you have frontal. This is the frontal, the maxillary, and anterior ethmoid. So these are the anterior ethmoids right there. So frontal, this, and this, all of these get drained by the middle meatus, and then you have superior meatus that drains only the posterior ethmoids. So posterior ethmoid is going to be your superior, then comes the middle, which drains the frontal, uh, anterior ethmoid, and the maxillary, uh, right? So frontal, maxillary, anterior ethmoid, and then you have the inferior one uh, going from the nasal lacrimal duct. That's what it is. Okay. Acute rhinosinusitis uh, is most commonly caused by viruses, for example, rhinovirus, may lead to superimposed bacterial infection, most commonly non typable H influenza, S pneumonia, and M caterellus. And these are the ones that will uh, usually be the one if they tell you this person has a runny nose. Paranasal sinuses uh, infections may extend to the orbits. Uh, so paranasal sinus, that's all of these sinuses, right? Uh, around the nose, uh, nasal sinus. So infections that happen here, you know, this is like, I didn't uh, call the dangerous area of face. Okay, uh, so the sinuses that are inside of this area, uh, these will lead to infection into your cavernous sinus, and that's why it's bad and brain, right? Um, but it can also lead to orbits and cause a complication like orbital cellulitis, cavernous sinus syndrome, and meningitis. Okay. Uh, Epictaxis, uh, nose bleeding, most commonly occurs in anterior segment of nostril, castleback plexus. Life-threatening hemorrhages occur in posterior segment. Sphenopalatine artery, a branch of maxillary artery. Common causes include foreign body, trauma, allergic rhinitis, and nasal angiofibromas, common in adolescent 
males. Castleback drives his Lexus with le his legs. Superior labial artery, anterior and posterior ethmoidal artery, uh, greater palatine artery, and spinopalatine artery. Okay, uh, this is an important one. Uh, you need to know the epitaxis happening in the anterior segment of the nostril as well as the posterior one. Uh, they both are important. So. Uh, most commonly occurs in anterior segment of nostril. So that's the one that's called Castleback uh, plexus. Life-threatening hemorrhages occur in posterior segment. Okay, so this one is the most serious one, the posterior segment hemorrhage. Anterior one is not as uh, the Castleback, which is the anterior, so don't mess that up. Uh, it's not the same in the posterior one. Uh, this one is way more uh, life-threatening. Uh, right, so spinopalatine, uh, let's just look at that. Okay, so... Okay, so it's uh, anastomos happens between the sphenopalatine artery, a branch of maxillary artery, right? So this is the sphenopalatine artery. Uh, that's the one that gets affected on the posterior side. In the castleback, it's going to be your anterior ethmoid artery. Remember, ethmoids are over here. Uh, posterior ethmoids were here. So posterior ethmoidal artery coming from there. This is the superior labial uh, artery coming from up here, uh, down here, from the teeth, the labile region, right? And the greater palatine artery coming in from down here. Uh, and this is your palate, right? So that's the palatine artery coming in and making your castle back. Common origin for anterior epitaxis. This is the one that's more dangerous. Uh, right here. Right. Okay, so uh, how can this happen? Uh, the most common cause includes foreign body, right? Uh, kids shoving stuff down their nose, up their nose, uh, trauma, allergic rhinitis, and nasal angiofibromas. These are common in adolescent males, okay? Uh, there's also a question about uh, our person who was bleeding uh, and then they to stop the bleeding or to contain it they started shoving cotton up their nose and then they went into a shock uh, what is the causative agent right it's going to be staphylococcus aureus uh, causing tsst toxic shock syndrome right uh, it can also a similar thing happens with tampons uh, tampons are known to cause toxic shock syndrome as well uh, head and neck uh, cancer. Most squamous cell carcinoma risk factors include tobacco, alcohol, uh, papilloma virus 16, oropharyngeal, and then you have Epstein Barr for nasopharyngeal cancers. Okay, uh, HPV 16 and 18 are known to cause cancer, right? All the other strands cause uh, warts and other stuff. Uh, Epstein Barr virus, nasopharyngeal cancer. Uh, field cancerization so carcinogens uh, damage white mucosal area which leads to multiple tumors that develop independently after exposure nasopharyngeal carcinoma may present with unilateral nasal obstruction discharge epitaxis eustachian tube obstruction may lead to otitis media with or without effusion and hearing loss so nasopharyngeal cancer may present with unilateral nasal obstruction, uh, discharge, and epitaxis. These are all very vague, so you won't be able to point, pinpoint that one to this, right? Uh, but they will also give you that there was weight loss, so you know it's something to do with cancer. Okay, and then 
uh, out of the option you can probably differentiate this out uh, eustachian tube obstruction may lead to otitis media okay with or without uh, effusion uh, hearing loss laryngeal papillomatosis also called recurrent uh, respiratory papillomatosis common benign laryngeal tumor for example vocal cords okay especially internal associated with hpv6 and 11 for this one uh why the vocal cords it's because it has a predilection for uh which one epithelial lining right or so it happens uh in like genital urinary tract as well somewhere uh, on the cervix because they have a squamous one as well and then you have it over here uh, which has a similar uh, lining i'm skipping on what kind it is uh, if i remember that they have the same lining and that's why it happens over there and here as well so when it happens at vocal cord it's called laryngeal papillomatosis and it happens due to uh, women who have it and then they give birth so it ends up in their oral cavity the bacteria or the virus sorry uh deep venous thrombosis this is the most important topic uh it gets asked in the multiple chapters so you need to know about this um it's gonna happen because of either they're going on a road trip uh in an rv long road trip where they're sitting and, and for a long time or they're on a flight uh, sitting for a long time okay uh, so these two are usually the ones that they use in a quest a question stem and when that happens when you're sitting up for a long time you have chances of developing thrombus okay a blood clot within a deep vein which leads to swelling and redness okay see how that is red more red than this one uh, warm and pain uh, this is critical uh, usually the pain is in uh, obviously the parts where it uh, goes to but sometimes they don't even give you all this and they just tell you it's a calf pain and that should be a buzzword for deep brain thrombosis Uh, it predisposed by a uh, workout triad that is stasis for example post-op long drive or flight hypercoagulability uh, this is uh, important as well it happens because of uh, factor V lane uh, right so defect in coagulation casket proteins such as factor V lane oral contraceptive use this is an important one as well it happens in uh, reproductive age women who are on birth control and also pregnancy because uh, it's just a human physiological uh, mechanism because uh, when a patient is pregnant and then when they deliver uh, chances are that they might go into postpartum hemorrhage so uh, to prevent that the body creates a hypercoagulable state so in case there is a hemorrhage, it can immediately clog it and plug it. Okay, so that's uh, that's the reason behind why it happens in pregnancy, because pregnancy is in a hypercoagulable state, right? Uh, and we already know about this. It doesn't listen to uh, anticoagulants, protein C and S. Uh, there's a mutation in this, so uh, it keeps making thrombin. Okay, endothelial damage, exposed uh, collagen, triggers ca uh, clotting cascade. Okay, uh, that's just what it is. Uh, most pulmonary emboli are, arise from proximal deep vein of lower extremity, iliac, femoral, or popliteal veins. Okay, so they'll tell you that they found, uh, they did a Doppler's and they found thrombosis and the person came in with uh, acute respiratory distress uh, right or uh, respiratory pain actually or pulmonary pain or you know have difficulty breathing they might not even give you anything and just say uh, just give you the respiratory rate is increased 
uh, right? So anything like that, that tells you there is a problem and they tell you there is thrombus in the cap, chances are that that thrombus got broken off and the clot uh, traveled all the way up to the heart and into the lungs from right atrium to right ventricle to the lungs, right? And there it can pass on because it's like a filter, right? So it's going to, and that's how you get, you know, pulmonary emboli. Uh, D dimer test is what they do to make sure that they're uh, to you know uh, confirm that there was a clot and then it got broken down because when a clot breaks down you get uh, what fibrins right and or D dimers so D dimer tests may be used clinically to rule out DVT if disease probability is low or moderate high sensitivity and low specificity this thing um, this test has a high sensitivity and low specificity. So it will pick it up, but it won't tell you uh, what this belongs to. Because remember, we do D-dimer tests for like MI, stroke, and this as well. Right? So, uh, Imaging test of choice is comp compression ultrasound with Doppler. So that's how they do it. They do a Doppler's ultrasound. Uh, to make sure uh, or confirm or to see if you have throm deep vein thrombosis. Uh, you use unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparins. For example, anoxyparin for prophylaxis and acute management. Uh, this one is safe to give in pregnancy because it does not cross the placenta. Warfarin does and what else? Low molecular weight heparin also cross uh, placenta. For anoxyparin, for example, it has XA, right? So it blocks uh, 10, activated 10 uh, clotting factor. For prophylaxis and acute management, use direct anticoagulants like rivaroxaban, again 10A, and epixaban 10A, right? Uh, for treatment and long term prevention. Okay. Uh, pulmonary emboli. So obstruction of the pulmonary artery of, or its branches by foreign material, usually thrombus, that originated elsewhere. Affected alveoli are ventilated but not perfused. Uh, I went over this uh, last time uh, in the yesterday where I explained what this meant. Okay. So affected alveoli or ventilated but not perfused, that's called uh, ventilation perfusion mismatch may present with sudden onset dyspnea, pleuritic chest pain, uh, tachypnea, tachycardia, hypoxemia, respiratory alkalosis, large emboli or settle embolus. Okay, uh, this is uh, a classic presentation. Uh, this is what you will see on x-ray. So that's called a settle embolus. For that, you need to know what a settle is. It's the thing you put on a horse, right? So that's called settle. So this is what they're referring to, the seat, not this part, right? And so when you see a settle embolism, embolus, that's what it looks like, a seat, like that part right there, right? Uh, the part where there is no blood entering is going to have a different uh, uh, contrast com compared to the parts that have blood, right? So it's going to be a little less than the other part. So that's how you differentiate or find, figure that out. So that is that. Let's go into this. Okay. Uh, let's look at a few more. Um, this is not a settle embolism. It's just embolism. Uh, but you, if you figure out that this is from going on to the left and this is going to the right, uh, lung and right in the middle it's stuck that's uh, basically how you figure that out okay. it can look like that as well it looks like that as well okay that's a classic finding for pulmonary embolism uh, they might not give you enough in clues in the question stem but then you they give you this then you know it's just like you telling you the answer that it's this Okay, 
So large emboli or saddle embolism, embolus um, may cause sudden death due to clot preventing blood from filling left ventricle and uh, increased right ventricle size, further compromising the left ventricle filling, causing obstructive shock. This is how you get the obstructive shock, right? Uh, CT pulmonary angiography is imaging's test of choice for pulmonary embolism. Okay. This is how we diagnose it. Uh, look for filling defects. So since blood is not coming there, it's that's known as uh, filling defect. Okay. ECG may show sinus tachycardia or uh, low, less commonly S1Q3T3 abnormality. Uh, so I told you how to figure out if it's there's a tachy or not, right? So you if that's the R wave, and then that's the other R wave, and then that's the other R wave. Uh, you count the boxes in between, and you know, uh, if there's only one box in between, that means it's um, beating at 300. Uh, if two, then 150. If three, then at 100. If four, then it's like 75. If it's five boxes in the middle, right? One box, two, three, four, five. Uh, then it's 60 beats per minute and if it's 6 then it's uh, 50 beats per minute uh, that's uh, if you just remember that then you don't have to go around calculating how many beats per minute this is okay just memorize those numbers so if it's anywhere uh, between 1 and 3 boxes uh, it's going to be tachycardia and by boxes, I mean, uh, you know, there is one big box and the big box also has small boxes in there. So not the small ones. I mean one big one. Okay. Uh, so ECG may show sinus tachycardia, obviously, because it's trying to pump out whatever blood it has because brain's like, yo, pump, pump, pump. But there is no blood in the left ventricle because it's stuck in the right ventricle because there is pressure or higher resistance because of the embolus that can't let it go through okay uh, s1q3t3 they don't give you that so don't have to memorize that lines of zan uh, and c okay i think it's these we'll look at those actually i don't think they give you this but just to be thorough Okay, so these are the lines. Oh, these are the lines, okay. So it's both of them, I guess. Okay, and that's found on the thrombus, I guess. Cool. Okay. They give you a lot of uh, clues when they're talking about this so you don't have to rely on on uh, this they might give you just this though when they're uh, when you have this they don't usually give you a lot of clues because you're supposed to figure out that there's a filling defect in the pulmonary arteries okay so life was then our interdigiting areas of pink platelet fibrin and red rbc's found only in thrombi formed before death Help distinguish pre and po post mortem uh, thrombi. Okay. Oh, okay. So that's how it's done. Um, treatment is anticoagulation, for example, heparin, direct thrombin, or factor 10A inhibitors. IVC filter if uh, anticoagulation is contraindicated. Types are fat, air, thrombus, bacteria, amniotic fluid, and tumor. Okay, you can get a fat thrombus or air, sorry, uh, fat emboli, emboli, uh, air emboli, thrombus emboli, uh, bacterial emboli, or amniotic fluid emboli, or tumor emboli. 
this is a important one and we'll read about it somewhere but uh, this one causes other symptoms other than just respiratory one as well like it's going to cause systemic symptoms as well uh, and embolus moves like a fat bat okay so oh they'll tell you right here uh, fat emboli associated with long bone fracture and liposuction classic triad of hypoxemia neurologic abnormalities and um, potential rash okay uh, so for this they'll tell you that the person was in an accident or some they fell or something like that that caused a fracture in their femur and if at any time there's a fracture at femur it's only uh, the question is about fat emboli okay um, that's the only one the uh, the only type of question they use that there's fracture and femur and they want you to know that a fracture in femur causes fat emboli. So femur is a long bone, so long bone fracture and liposuction as well. This also came up once. I, I came across a question with this one. And I was unsure about this at the time. Okay. Uh, classic triad of hypoxemia, neurologic abnormalities happen. Okay. Uh, and potential rash. So, so this is how you need, like, this is how they're going to present it to you. That there's low uh, oxygen saturation or partial pressure of oxygen right because there's no blood uh, getting perfused through them those alveoli uh, so hypoxemia neurologic abnormalities because the brain is starving for oxygen right so it's getting suffocated and potential rash uh, why potential rash because the yeah, I'm not sure about that one. Okay, uh, air emboli, nitrogen bulb bubbles precipitate in ascending divers. So casein disease and decompressing uh, sickness. This is important. It's called the bands, right? Uh, you need to know what the bands are because they use that term. And you word. So the bands, also known as decompression sickness, or casein disease is a condition that occurs in scuba divers when dissolved gases mainly nitrogen come out of solution in the bloodstream okay remember uh, nitric oxide is in the endothelium of the vessels uh, it resides there so when there's enough uh, the atmosphere pressure inside of your body and to compare to the outside atmospheric pressure is going to push it in right it's squeezing it in so the squeezing causes uh, dissolved gases to come out of its uh, place and into the blood. Okay, so nit uh, when it does that, just you know, it's like squeezing a sponge in the water. When you squeeze it, it's gonna have air bubbles coming out, right? So the air bubbles are what the air emboli is made of. Nitrogen bubbles precipitate in ascending divers casein disease and decompression sickness treat with hyperbaric o2 that just means atmospheric uh, pressure you increase it on uh, uh, with o2 or can be iatrogenic secondary to invasive procedures for example central line placement so even if it does reach there it's not going to affect it because you have a central line placement over there uh, no sorry it could be because of this the reason sorry yeah or it's because of an invasive procedure like central line placement and you forgot to clear the syringe of air bubbles before administering it and that leads to air emboli as well amniotic fluid emboli typically occurs uh, during labor or postpartum but can be due to in uterine trauma Okay, so this is what the question stem is going to be about. The patient gave delivery and then they had a hard time breathing afterwards and they went into DIC. Uh, okay, it's very rare, but if it happens, there's high mortality.
mediastinal pathology. Normal mediastinum contains heart, thymus, lymph nodes, esophagus, and aorta. Mediastinal masses, some pathologies, for example, lymphoma, lung cancer, abscess, can occur in any compartment, but there are common associations. Okay. Um, let's look at the photos while we do this. So we remember it. Okay, uh, so anterior, so that would be this anterior compartment right here. Uh, no, sorry, this anterior compartment right here. Right, so that's the anterior compartment. Here you have four T's, the thyroid, okay, it goes from up here to here. Okay, so our suprasternal goiter. Uh, they don't acknowledge the superior one, so I guess it's on uh, this whole anterior part up to the neck. Okay, so from down here to the neck, it's all anterior, not superior. Okay, so thyroid sub, uh, substernal goiter, thymic neoplasm, so that's in the thymus uh, up down here. Uh, teratoma or terrible lymphomas, right? So lymph nodes over there. So four T's thyroid. Uh, thymic neoplasm and uh, teratomas and terrible lymphomas okay. uh, then the middle compartment uh, that's with the esophagus right so esophageal carcinoma can cause a mass there metastasis hiatal hernia and uh, so hiatal hernia would be from here and bronchiogenic cyst, right? Uh, hiatal hernia was uh, stomach coming through the diaphragm, right? Uh, metastasis and bronchogenic cysts. These will call, cause mass in middle, okay? And then you have posterior. That's, uh, this is the posterior compartment. Uh, neurogenic tumors, so neurofibromas or multiple myeloma. That happens in this, right? So, yeah, media cell masses. For this one, remember the anterior one. They usually ask you about that one. Uh, okay. Uh, mediastinitis. Inflammation of mediastinal tissues, commonly due to post-operative complication of uh, cardiothoracic procedure, less than 14 days. Esophageal perforation or contagious spread of odontogenic uh, or retropharyngeal infection. Chronic mediastinitis uh, is also called fibrosing mediastinitis. It's due to increase in proliferation of connective tissue in mediastinum. Uh, stenum. Uh, there's, uh, this is usually caused by histoplasma capsulatum. Okay. Uh, which is a common cause. Uh, clinical features for uh, fever tachycardia, leukocytosis, chest pain, sternal wound drainage. Uh, let's do a quick revision of this. Okay. So this is the one, uh, endemic location is Mississippi and, uh, wait, no, that's histoplasmosis. Where's histoplasma capsulatum? Oh, that is, okay, my bad. <laughs> yeah, this is the one, okay. So it's the one that hides in, uh, 
in uh, macrophage, right? So that's how you remembered it. Histohydes in macrophages. Okay, so that's the one. It's associated with uh, splunking, also known as bird or bat dropping in caves. Uh, diagnosis via urine or serum antigen. So when you go cave exploring, it's called splunking when there's like, you know, aerosols with bat droppings. Uh, unique sign was palatal tongue ulcer, splenomegaly, pancytopenia, erythema, medicine. Okay, macrophages filled with histoplasma. It happens in Mississippi and Ohio River. So that's the green one right there. Okay. Where did I? Uh, clinical feature uh, is fever, tachycardia, leukocytosis, chest pain, and sternal wound drainage. Okay, uh, pneumomediastinitism, uh, stenum, it presence of it's the presence of gas, usually air, in the mediastinum. It can either be spontaneous due to rupture of pulmonary pleb or secondary, for example, the trauma uh, due to trauma, iatrogenic, or Borheve syndrome. Borheve syndrome was, uh, you know, the lacerations due to uh, whatever reason in the esophagus. Was it laceration or was it perforation? I think this one is the perforation and the laceration was mallory rays syndrome. Just make sure. Uh, transmural, yeah, so this is the perforation one. Uh, usually the distal esophageal rupture due to wire retching. And Mallory base was the uh, longitudinal laceration one. Okay. Uh, ruptured alveoli allow tracking of air into the mediastinum via peribronchial and perivascular sheets. Uh, clinical features chest pain, dyspnea, voice change, subcutaneous emphysema uh, with a positive Hummen sign. That's crepitus on cardiac auscultation. Okay, this is the thing they give you in the question stand, the buzzword to tell you that there's air in the uh, layer of the chest wall, lungs, or whatever. Uh, if you find crepitus or hear crepitus there, right? But if you hear crepitus in the in, around the neck area, that's not uh, due to a pulmonary pleb. Okay, that's how you differentiate between uh, Borheve and uh, something else uh, where, uh, yeah, the pulmonary blab, right? So if it's spontaneous and pulmonary blab, it's going to happen somewhere in the lung area. Uh, you'll hear the crepitus there. But if it happens near the neck, it's because of Borheve syndrome, okay? And that's basically all that's important out of these uh, they don't usually test you on this one. Uh, I haven't come, came across any question about this, but they do test you on this. They might test you on the esophageal perforation, but that's also, you know, just this for he, uh, or like, uh, Mallory ways. And that's what this one will cause. And then that, when that gets, uh, you know, into when that gets serious or like, more trauma happens there that's when it turns into esophageal perforation but for that they'll tell you that there is hemothorax somewhere okay uh so on to flow volume loop i think this is very important that you understand it because they do give you this chart itself or they'll give you uh, these values uh it's very easy to remember and i'll tell you why in a second okay uh Okay, so when it's obstructive lung disease, it's always going to the left. The way you remember that is that the restrictive goes to the right and R is for right and R is for restrictive. So when it shifts to the right, it's going to be a restrictive disease. Uh, and that makes the left one obstructive. It's always going to be one of these two, right? The obstructive diseases are your, these ones, 
uh, emphysema, uh, chronic bronchitis, asthma, and bronchiectasis, and uh, restrictive ones are all the other ones, like uh, that prevent you from breathing normally. Okay, uh, like expansion of chest wall is limited, or uh, the compliance of your uh, compliance of your alveoli is decreased. Okay, so that's going to be a restricted one. In this one, the compliance increases. The problem is with the air going out, not with the air coming in. Okay, because in emphysema, you lose the elastic recoil, so it doesn't uh, it doesn't uh, let the air out as easily yet it's, as it does in normally. Okay, uh, so the residual volume increases in obstructive lung disease, uh, FRC also increases that's functional residual capacity right that's rv and this and then you have tlc which also increases and uh feb1 uh which decreases okay uh so out of this memorize that rv frc and tlc is are the first three values okay rv is the first value frc is the second and tlc and these are the values that they give you and you need to see if it increases or it, if it decreases okay and that's how you will differentiate between the two uh, if they don't give you that they'll give you these okay feb1 that's force expiration volume in one second okay so when you force it out uh, take a deep breath and then force it out uh, and that amount of time, if it increases, that means um, this is decreased, okay? Or did I say that wrong? Yeah, so that increases, this decreases. Why? Because the amount of volume you're putting out is uh, less than what you would in one second if it was normal, okay? So... The amount of volume you're breathing out in one second, if it's if the volume is less than uh, what you normally would, that is what causes the decrease in Fe1c. Then you have forced vital capacity, right? That's decreased as well. That's decreased in both, okay? And this is um, decreased uh, more than it is in this. Uh, why does that matter? Because that means uh, the ratio between the two will be decreased, right, uh, of FEV1. So the number at the top is lower than the number at the bottom, right? So this would be like 0 0.5 over 2. Whereas here, it's 1 over 1. So it could be normal or it could be, you know, increased if this, is, uh, if this one is lower than FEV1. So if they tell you that there's a decrease in FEV1, so they did a spirometry uh, six months ago, and right now it's like 60% of what it was before, right? That means there's a decrease in FEV1 and, and over FVC ratio, okay? If it's a decrease, it's an obstructive lung disease. Uh, once you get that locked, then you just figure out which obstructive lung disease it is from the other clues. Uh, for restrictive, everything is decreased, okay, except for the ratio. The ratio is going to be normal or increased, okay. Uh, so FEV1 is over FE FVC. Okay, uh, in case you want to see what this chart is, if you just memorize this, uh, you'll get the answers. But what this is, is that the point between these two are the vital capacity, okay? And then the point between the zero and the highest point is the total lung capacity, okay? And the space between this and this is the residual volume. So when uh, the residual volume increases, right, so RV increases, uh, you get it shifting from this point to here. So that's the shift from that. 
and uh, that increases total lung uh, capacity as well right so that's how you get total lung capacity like that okay and functional residual capacity is the RB plus uh, BC right so that increases as well so FRC is increased that way so this is during expiration and this is during inspiration when you uh, inspire what happens your chest wall co comes out right uh, your diaphragm goes down which causes the, the lungs to uh, spread out more right it pulls it so it creates a negative pressure so that's what this negative pressure is about uh, that's a negative flow and then when you exhale it goes into the positive one so when you exhale immediately it's going to be really fast within the first second but in the early first second and then the late uh, second it's going to slow down a little right um, when the air is coming out of the small alveoli that don't have strong elastic recoil or whatever uh, then uh, this is the normal one right and then in restrictive uh, see how the residual volume is decreased right so that's how you get decrease in that uh, zero to this point is decreased as well so TLC, uh, sorry FRC is decreased as well and TLC is decreased as well. Uh, FEV1, uh, you see the amplitude of this. Uh, actually, it looks the same. But amplitude of this is uh, lower, right, uh, during inspiration. So why is that? Because the chest wall is not expanding as it used to, right? So that's what this is. Um, that happens in old age as well. But what else happens in old age? The compliance increases so that will also cause uh, balancing out right so even though there's restrictive chest wall there's compliance in the alveoli that takes care of that so that's why so it's normal it normalizes that way okay uh, on to this obstructive lung diseases uh, how much time I guess we still have time uh, obstructive lung diseases, uh, obstruction of airflow increases FRC, RV, and TLC. Air trapping in lungs with premature airway closure at high lung volumes. Uh, so this is all the values that we saw, right? So we saw that these three increase and these decreases, right? So that's what they're saying. Obstruction of airflow increases FRC, RV, and TLC. That's air trapping in the lungs with premature airway closure at high lung volumes. Okay. So if this is the alveoli, right, and um, it, the air is coming from here. Uh, okay. So when the air is coming in at high volumes, what's happening is it's getting uh, closed, right? So the air is not getting in. Or if the air is getting in uh, and there's too much volume, uh, then that causes a uh, little closure over here, okay? So uh, why is that closure uh, not good for you? Because normally what happens is this, has an elastic recoil so that gives it a tendency to uh, collapse inwards right um, but there's such surfactant and air that prevents the collapse but when the compliance is uh, increased the elastic recoil decreases and then uh, this doesn't collapse so if it doesn't do that the air doesn't flow outwards and back out right so no. uh, that's what this whole thing is about so in emphysema you lose the elasticity okay uh, and that leads to ventilation perfusion mismatch okay uh, emphysema uh, how do you uh, you know figure out that it's emphysema in a question stem uh, if they give you a physical appearance if they're gonna have a barrel shaped chest all right uh, you need to know what that looks like to remember that. 
Um, bear shaped chest because you're breathing in a lot harder. Uh, so it's gonna have your chest look like that. Okay, like that. Uh, yeah. Okay. So bear shaped chest expiration is prolonged, uh, and or through pursed lips. Uh, why do you do that? It's to increase airway pressure and prevent airway collapse. Okay. So when, uh, since there is no elastic recoil, right, uh, and all that, there's a tendency to collapse on itself, apparently. I think I got my concept wrong over there. But remember this. Okay. I think... Let me make sure what this is. Oh, okay, right. So this is what what keeps it uh, open for a longer time, because uh, high high volume it causes a closure, right? We just talked about that. So when you breathe through pursed lips, uh, what you're doing is you're creating a pressure. Okay. Uh, so basically, if you have alveoli like that, and then you know the closure into the airway uh, when you're breathing out the chest wall is coming in the diaphragm is coming up pushing it all out of this right but at high volumes what's going to happen since there's decreased elasticity this thing can uh, all get flowed out right because along with chest wall and diaphragm you also need elasticity to get pulled the, or push the air out of the alveoli so uh, if there's low elasticity, this is only going to let out a little air before the valve closes or the alveoli or the airway closes, right? So prevent that closure. What we do is we increase the the airway resistance. So the resistance keeps this uh, at bay. It does. It prevents this from closing and collapsing the airway from collapsing, right? So that's what the collapsing is. Good thing we figured that out. So, so when the when you breathe in air, right? So it comes in like that, like that, like that. Uh, this thing is gonna fill up a lot more because the compliance is increased in this. Okay. And when it's time to release it, uh, it only lets out a little bit of air. Uh, why? Because as soon as it lets out a little. There's not enough air resistance here the, uh, or pressure created in this to keep this at bay, right? So to prevent this from collapsing. So a little air is going to come out and it's only going to open up this much airway for it to escape. Uh, and that's only until the diaphragm and the chest wall can make it go out. So when the chest wall and diaphragm does its maximum effect and only a little bit goes out, this is going to collapse because the alveoli can don't have the elasticity to push out all the air and you know make this open up and so the air can go out uh, so to prevent that what we do is even with this low air we create a resistance through per slips so when the, the resist what the resistance does is this air it creates this pressure uh, in the airway to make this open up this and keep it open until other particles of air come out as well, right? So more air can come out now than before due to this resistance. Hopefully, I make sense to you now.
So bear shaped chest expiration is prolonged and or through pursed lips. It increases airway pressure and prevents airway collapse. The pathology is uh, centri uh, SNR and there's pan SNR, right? So this is the centri SNR. Uh, it affects the respiratory bronchioles while sparing the distal alveoli. So these are the distal alveoli and this is the respiratory bronchiole. Uh, it's associated with tobacco or smoking, um, B and C. Frequently in upper lobes, it smokes, uh, smoke rises up. Then you have pensinar that affects respiratory bronchioles and alveoli. Okay, so uh, the, uh, you need to know that the pathology of this uh, is different from pathology of this. Okay, this one happens because of smoking. Okay, uh, and it happens in the respiratory bronchioles. Whereas this one is more about hereditary, okay? Uh, it's genetics. Why? Because uh, what effect gets affected is uh, it affects the respiratory bronchioles and alveoli, both of them. Uh, it's associated with the alpha-1 antitrypsin, okay? Uh, deficiency. So what does antitrypsin do? do? It uh, inhibits elastase activity. Okay, it has A's in it. That means it uh, cleaves elasticity uh, or elastin, right? You can think of it like that. So elastin is broken down by elastase and uh, this is regulated by alpha-1 antitrypsin. So when you have alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, what happens is that elastase is not inhibited anymore and there is an uncontrolled activity of elastase. So elastase then... Uh, keeps breaking down or cleaving the elastin right and that causes the loss of elasticity in this and which causes increase in compliance okay so you have enlarged enlargement of air spaces which decreases recoil elastic recoil and it increases compliance okay uh, there's a decrease in uh, DLCO or carbon monoxide from the destruction of the alveolar walls. This is important that you remember. Um, we already talked, well, I talked about this uh, in the last one, what this is. It's basically just, uh, it's basically just the alveolar and the capillary, right? So if that's the capillary, there's the alveoli. The air comes in and the diffusion that happens is at a constant rate with uh, carbon monoxide okay so if uh, that's how we determine that if we give carbon monoxide air in the face mask and then we check in the uh, you know capillary uh, it should be 100% uh, carbon monoxide in the capillary okay but if you're giving 100% in the air but in the capillary we only find like 60% that means not everything is getting diffused through right so there's something wrong between this connection where the gas exchange happens. And uh, it happens in emphysema because there's destruction of alveolar walls. Okay, so there's destruction of this. So that's why it can uh, diffuse the gas into the capillary. Okay, so a decrease in DLCO from destruction of alveolar walls, arrow in D and decrease in blood volume in pulmonary capillaries okay uh, that's just a perfusion thing uh, imbalance of protease and antiproteases um, which increases elastase activity which leads to increase in loss of elastic fibers and increases the lung compliance already talked about that uh, what's important here is that in instead of uh, telling you that it's uh, elastin and elastase they might just say proteases and antiproteases it's the, still the same thing okay it's interchangeable uh, other uh, chest x-ray there's increase in AP diameter a flattened diaphragm so if they give you this buzzword right here 
plant diaphragm. It's emphysema, which is your obstructive lung disease, and you can go on from there. You don't have to look at anything else because if they say the diaphragm is flattened, this is a buzzword for emphysema. Okay. Flattened or barrel chest, you know, stuff like that. Uh, or there's also, you know, since there's alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, um, there'll be some, uh, they'll give you like increased LFTs or something indicating there's something wrong with the liver. And they'll tell you there's trouble breathing as well or work or breathing is increased or something like that. So if there's a disease that connects the liver with the lung, chances are it's an alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency because there's not that many things that connect those two only. Because if it was cancer, it's going to be metastasized to other places as well, not just one place. And it's coming from colon because colon gets filtered out in the liver and that's how that goes there. So what I'm talking about that is like a carcinoid syndrome, right? So carcinoid syndrome will cause wheezing and stuff. Uh, that is a lung thing. But that can only happen and uh, through metastasis if it's happening through that uh, when it's in the colon. Why? Because uh, normally when uh, it secretes uh, hormones and stuff, the carcinoid syndrome, it gets uh, neutralized or metabolized by the liver when it goes there because that's what the filtering is for however when you start wheezing and stuff that means the liver can't keep up with the metabolism of the hormone so now it's leaking through into the system and then the system is reacting to those hormones which is in the lungs it's wheezing and all that stuff okay uh, we did the carcinoid syndrome in endo Okay, so increase in AP diameter, that's the barrel chest. Flattened diaphragm, buzzword. Increase in lung field lucency. Chronic inflammation is mediated by CD8 T cells, uh, neutrophils, and macrophages. I think I have like, how much time? Six minutes. Okay. Uh, so chronic inflammation is mediated by uh, CD8 T cells, neutrophils, and macrophages. Cool. Not important but just remember that it's CD8 T cells and not CD4. However, CD4 is the one that recruits macrophages through intraferon gamma and IL2. And then this one secretes IL12 uh, to do a feedback to CD4 and then again recruit more macrophages and neutrophil. And remember, Interferon gamma and IL-2 also recruit cytotoxic T cells, that's CD8 T cells. Okay, and they both recruit more neutrophils as well. Uh, we'll continue this after the break. On to obstructive lung diseases, uh, type, presentation, pathology, and others. Okay. Uh, chronic bronchitis. This is wheezing, crackles, cyanosis hypoxemia due to shunting, dyspnea, uh, uh, carbon dioxide retention, and secondary polycythemia. So up over here, you need to know why hypoxemia is happening, right? It's because, uh, remember, when there's hypox, uh, for any reason, there is hypoxia in some alveoli, those get vasoconstricted and the blood from there gets shunted to other places. Uh, however, the blood flow doesn't increase, right? So because of that, um, there is decreased amount of oxygen compared to as it would be for the whole thing. Uh, so that's why you get less oxygen in the blood. Okay, uh, dyspnea, difficulty in breathing. Carbon dioxide retention happens as well. Okay, uh, that's important uh, because there is a problem with diffusion or whatever. Uh, we'll read about that here and then secondary polycythemia. This just happens because there's uh, low oxygen in the blood so Your brain tells your kidneys to throw out more erythropoietin and then the erythropoietin is going to stimulate more RBC cells so The theory is that when you have increased amount of RBC what you have is increased amount of hemoglobin to carry oxygen as well So whatever oxygen they can carry there's more amount now Okay, to overcome this 
Uh, so it's a sort of compensation for that. Uh, wheezing is a uh, how you uh, let's say this is the buzzword I guess for you know any kind of problem with breathing that's uh, due to obstructive lung disease. Okay, so chronic bronchitis has it. Uh, it happens in uh, something else that we read. I think. Uh, there was one more thing that it happens in, but yeah, and oh, sorry, it happens in this and asthma, so wheezing there as well. Okay, uh, pathology, uh, his uh, hypertrophy and hyperplasia of mucus secreting glands. Okay, yeah, that's what it is. So, this is what happens in like chronic smokers and stuff because they have debris build up and uh their lungs and alveoli and all that so uh, the macrophageal cell containing cells and all that stuff get hypertrophy so even when there is no debris or whatever or um, there will be more mucus anyways and then what happens is not all the mucus get cleared out so then the debris get stuck in the mucus and then the mucus itself irritates the skin and makes more mucus to clear that out as well so you'll have uh, more mucus. So that's what chronic bronchitis is, right? Uh, so hypertrophy and hyperplasia of mucus secreting glands in bronchi leads to reed index. That's thickness of mucosal gland layer to thickness of wall between epithelium and cartilage, more than 50%. For this, you need to, this is an important concept. They test you on this. So let's look at that. Okay, so this is what read index is. Uh, they compare the gland to uh, the layer of this, right? So thickness of mucus, uh, mucosal gland layer to the thickness of wall between the epithelium and cartilage. So that's between the epithelium. This is the epithelium. So that's the basement membrane. That's where you look it from. And between the cartilage. So that's the end of cartilage. So between uh, the epithelium and cartilage, this layer subtract this much is what you get uh, for this right so uh, that's how big this becomes okay so or not subtract but this is the formula for that so you take this and divide it by whatever uh, this is from here to here okay so here to here divided by from here to here and that's how you get the read index okay on uh, diagnostic criteria productive cough for more than three months in a year for more than two consecutive years okay so uh, how do you diagnose this it's when you have more than a uh, cough that lasts more than three months uh, then it gets resolved but then it happens again uh, for more than two years right it keeps happening so that's when you have chronic bronchitis uh, DLCO may be normal so there's no problem with diffusion usually so it could be normal okay sir no asthma so asthma, asymptomatic baseline with intermittent episodes of coughing, wheezing, tachypnea, dyspnea, hypoxemia, decrease in inspiratory and expiratory ratio, mucus plugging for, yeah, so that's E. There's a mucus plug. We forgot to look at all of these, so let's do that now. So that's the barrel shape, increase in AP diameter, right? Uh, this is emphysema, you see expansion of plebs, or like alveoli, I mean, right? And there's destruction of the alveolar wall happening as well. And here you see uh, low black circles, those are alveoli. And then the septas are also thinned out. So that's what you're seeing over here, the destruction of the septas. 
uh, then there's that. Where the yet? Where the okay. So that's what it is, right? So alveoli. For this, you need to know what normal alveoli looks like. So okay. So this is what the normal one looks like. Okay, like that. So here, what you see is there's a gap between this, right? Uh, so it's opened up between the two air sacs. So that's due to the destruction. You don't see that here, right? It's all one line. Okay. This is an alveolar sac. It's intact. Right. This is an alveolar sac. It's intact. Okay. If there is a gap between the two and you see multiple areas of it, that means it has a pathology there that's causing it to uh, do that. Okay. Elastic fibers, reticular fibers, alveolar, all that, okay. And then they're talking about here an asthma E. Okay, so that's mucus plugging. Uh, this thing you're seeing inside, I guess, is what it is. But I can't read it, so whatever. <laughs> Not important. What they'll give you is this stuff for the questions then. Okay, so again, asthma is asymptomatic baseline with intermittent episodes of coughing, wheezing, tachypnea, dyspnea, hypoxemia, and decrease in inspiratory and expiratory ratio. Right, this is uh, the left shift, right? Uh, mucus plugging, uh, okay. Severe attacks may lead to pulses paradoxes, and triggers are viral URIs. Uh, allergens and stress so they'll give you this remember it's the difference between systolic uh, pressures uh, more than 10 mmhg right let's quickly look at that and recall that Okay, so pulses paradoxes is decrease in amplitude of systolic blood pressure by 10 mmHg during inspiration. Okay, so that's what that is. So increase in uh, return during inspiration. Uh, uh, so that will cause increase in RV filling, which causes interventricular septum bow towards left ventricle due to in decrease in pericardial compliance which leads to decrease in LV ejection volume, which leads to decrease in systolic BP. Okay, it's seen in COPE, so that's croup, uh, obstructive sleep apnea, asthma, and COPD. Uh, okay, and cardiac tamponade, so PCOPE. Cool. Okay. Uh, so pathology is hyper-responsive bronchi, uh, which leads to reversible bronchoconstriction, smooth muscle hypertrophy, and hyperplasia. Cruxman spirals, uh, this is what they give you. They don't give you this name. They'll give you either a photo of this or description of this. Okay, And the description is charcoal lane crystals okay? uh, or shed epithelium form hold. Uh, mucus plugs and charcoal lane crystals that's G so that right there is what they give you I came across both of them so they either give you this and you need to know this happens why it's because the epithelium is shed from the mucus plugs right uh, from world mucus plugs and then you have charcoal lane crystals that look like crystals in the from the lungs uh, it's eosinophilic 
hexagonal double pointed crystals broken formed from breakdown of eosinophils in the sputum. The DLCO is normal or increased in this. Obviously, because there is destruction of epithelium, right? Uh, okay. Uh, type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. Uh, diagnosis supported by spirometry with or without metacholine challenge. This is important because uh, this is how you diagnose asthma. Uh, so you need to know about metacholine challenge. Not what it is, just that this is used for asthma. That's what you need to know about it to diagnose this. Okay. Uh, it, it, the question could be that this person comes in with a difficulty in breathing and all this and after giving a steroid uh, they had a better uh, they felt better and in breathing improved so what's the next step on uh, to confirm the diagnosis so the next step would be methacholine challenge NSAIDs exacerbated respiratory disease is a combination of COX inhibition leukotriene overproduction uh, this causes airway constriction, cons chronic sinusitis, with nasal polyps and asthma symptoms. Okay. Uh, bronchiectasis. This is important as well. Uh, so daily purulent sputum. Recurrent infections, most often Pseudomonas arginosa, hemoptosis, and digoclubbing. If there is a problem with breathing of any kind and they tell you that there is clubbing, that leaves only two things um, that it could be. It could be either a cancer, uh, some kind of cancer, or it could be bronchiectasis. Okay, if they have digital clubbing with difficulty in breathing. So chronic necrotizing infection of bronchi or obstruction because of this. Okay, uh, so it leads to permanently dilated airways, uh, increase in compliance, decrease in recoil. Associated with bronchial obstruction, poor ciliary motility, for example, tobacco smoking or Cardegner syndrome, cystic fibrosis, Right, so the airway has been dilated. Okay. Uh, cystic fibrosis, arrow, and showed in a dilated airway with mucus plug. Okay. Uh, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, pulmonary infection, like mycoplasm, uh, mycobacterium avium. Okay. Uh, this happens in, uh, it's a, you know, AIDS defining uh, disease okay uh, so for this you need to know uh, that all of these cause bronchiectasis uh, what it is it's uh, permanently dilated airways what's the most uh, common culprit that's pseudomonas arginosa okay Cartagena cystic fibrosis can cause bronchiectasis cool Okay, next. Uh, hold on, give me a second. I'm going to check if I have any notes. Okay. So uh, for sentry and our emphysema, I have a note that says neutrophils cause this. Okay, so neutrophils cause this. Uh, 
go back and what is this? Okay. Um, so DLCO decreases in this. Uh, it's right there, but it's important that you remember it for this. Depends on our emphysema. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh. Okay, that's it for that. Uh, on to bronchiectasis. I do have notes on this. So, clubbing is the most important thing that points towards bronchiectasis. Then, uh, there is bleeding from hypertrophied bronchial arteries, which leads to hypertrophy uh, because of chronic airway inflammation. That leads to hypertrophied bronchial arteries prone to rupture with coughing. Okay. Uh, it's basically the mechanism of this uh, necrotizing infection, bronchi obstruction leading to permanent, permanently dilated airways. Okay. Uh, next. Restrictive lung disease uh, or diseases. Okay, uh, may lead to decrease in lung volumes. Uh, that's decreasing FVC and TLC and also RV2, right? So normal or increase in FV1 over FVC ratio. Patients present with short, shallow breaths. Now we are on to uh, restrictive lung diseases, right? So everything is decreased except for uh, the ratio, which is normal or increased. Uh, patient presents with short and shallow breaths, right? Because since they can't expand their lungs, what they're uh, compensating with is uh, increase in respiratory rate and decrease in tidal volume. Okay, so types are alerted, altered uh, respiratory mechanics. So extra pulmonary, uh, normal DLCO, and normal AA gradient. Okay, so this is because of something that's not wrong with uh, the lungs, but something else. Okay, uh, so AA gradient, there's nothing wrong with the uh, diffusion. And you have normal DLCO, and it's outside of the alveoli and pulmonary stuff. Okay, so one reason could be because of respiratory muscle weakness like polio or myasthenia gravis or Guillain-Barre syndrome and ALS. Uh, I think I went over, I talked about like this when I was talking about that. Uh, chest wall abnormalities are scoliosis and severe obesity. Okay, so all of this can cause restrictive lung disease. But now, uh, there's also the ones that have problem inside of the lungs, right, that cause restrictive. So diffuse parenchymal lung diseases, also called interstitial lung diseases, pulmonary, uh, so these are the pulmonary causes. There is decrease in DLCO, and then there's increase in AA gradient. So uh, diffusion problem or you know ventilation perfusion. Uh, there's no ventilation perfusion uh, defect. The defect is in the gas exchange. That's because of the AA gradient difference. Okay. Uh, or whatever the reason is that there's, uh, it's affecting the exchange. Pneumoconiosis, for example, coal workers, uh, pneumoconiosis, silicosis, and asbestosis. So after this, we're gonna learn about all of these, just like we learned about the obstructive ones. Okay, so just the names are, or what in, what's included in the restrictive lung diseases are pneumoconiosis, then sarcoidosis. That's bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy, non-caseating granulomas, 
There's increase in ACE and calcium and sarcoidosis. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Granulomatosis with polyangitis. Pulmonary Langerhans cell histiocytosis. Eosinophilic granuloma. Hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Drug toxicity, for example, bleomycin and busulfan. Bus we just read about those in the last one. Amiodarone and methotrexate, right? Um, hemat drugs. Acute respiratory distress syndrome, okay, ARDS. And there's also radiation induced lung injury. This is associated with pro inflammatory cytokine release for example tnf alpha interleukin 1 and interleukin 6 may be asymptomatic but most common symptoms are dry cough and dyspnea with or without low-grade fever acute radiation pneumonitis develops within 3 to 12 weeks exudative phase radiation fibrosis may develop after 6 to 12 months okay uh, so radiation in induced lung injury is uh, done through the inflammatory cytokines right mostly it's asymptomatic but uh, it does cause cough and dyspnea with low grade fever okay acute radiation pneumonitis develops within 3 to 12 weeks uh, exudative phase and radiation fibrosis develop after 6 to 12 months so if there's some kind of restrictive problem happening with between this and this right so it's not going to be you know so 12 weeks is like four months so between four months to six months it's not going to be fibrosis it's going to be because of something else uh idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis this is progressive fibrotic lung disease of unknown etiology right idiopathic you only pick this when you have ruled out all the other options so you don't go directly to this because you have to work go through each option and do the differential uh, and figure out what's given in the question stem and just as importantly what's not given right uh, for that you need to know all the buzzwords and hence that you need to look out for so progressive fibrotic lung disease of unknown etiology may involve multiple cycles of lung injury inflammation and fibrosis it's associated with cigarette smoking, environmental pollutants, and genetic defects. Okay. Now, findings are uh, progressive dyspnea, fatigue, non-productive cough, right? All of these are very vague. They don't really pinpoint and to scream uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, right? but you also get crackles and clubbing right so the clubbing uh you can think of fibrosis because of that right uh because not many things have clubbing that are pulmonary causes uh and you have crackles the crackles uh are still not a buzzword okay uh imaging shows peripheral reticular opacities and traction uh, bronchiectasis with or without the honeycomb appearance of lung, which is advanced disease. This is a uh, buzzword, honeycomb appearance for bronchiectasis, okay? Not for pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, for that, you need to know what this looks like. Uh, let me just make sure it is for okay not bronchic cases it's for fibrosis itself I was wrong okay uh, so that's a buzzword for fibrosis let's look at that uh, so it looks like that, a honeycomb in lungs, right? And I guess that's what they mean. Yeah, so appearance of the lung. It looks like a honeycomb. Lung disease. 
So that's a buzzword for fibrosis. Okay. And for that, you need to know what honeycomb looks like. It's right there. Okay. Uh, so histological uh, pattern, a usual interstitial pneumonia. Complications are pulmonary hypertension, right heart failure, arrhythmias, coronary heart disease, sorry, artery disease, respiratory failure, and lung cancer. Okay, so it can lead to all of these things. Uh, normally, you would pick this when all the other options are extra pulmonary uh, options, right? So like something due to heart disease or liver, kidney or something like that. And this is the only one that's given for pulmonary. Uh, usually, that's the only time you will pick this. Uh, hypersensitivity pneumonitis. It's mixed type 3 and 4 hypersensitivity reaction to environmental antigens. <laughs> Often seen in farmers and bird fanciers. Uh, acutely causes dyspnea, cough, chest tightness, fever, and headache. All of these are, you know, by itself, it's very vague. But when you start seeing that there's dyspnea, okay, so there's something wrong with the lung. There's chest tightness, right? So there's wrong with the heart. And then there's cough again, or lung. And fever, that's because of some kind of uh, inflammation or infection or something. Right. Uh, often limiting if stimulus is removed. Chronically leads to irreversible fibrosis with non caseating granuloma. Again, this is uh, telling you what it, it could be. And alveolar septal thickening. Traction bronchiectasis. Again, same thing. So, hypersensitivity uh, pneumonitis, they'll give you. Uh, you know, symptom that looks like it's a type 3 or uh, T-cell mediated hypersensitivity or delayed type. Right. And then they tell you that there's something wrong with breathing and chest tightness is there, right? Uh, that should give a clue to its being uh, that. Okay, sarcoidosis, very important. Usually it's going to be middle-aged women. Uh, and it could be uh, a black woman. Uh, usually that's the one they go with. Characterized by immune mediated widespread non caseating granulomas. Actually, they stopped using race in questions recently. Uh, so it could be any kind of women. Uh, and they might even change it to men now. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, sarcoidosis characterized by immune mediated widespread non caseating granulomas okay uh, it's very easy to figure out it's this uh, its presentation they'll tell you that it's, uh, there's elevated serum ACE levels and elevated CD4 CD8 ratio in bronchial bronchio sorry bronco alveolar lavage fluid more common in black females okay so that's where it is it's not that I'm racist or anything. It's in it. Okay. Uh, often asymptomatic except for enlarged lymph nodes. Uh, chest x-ray shows bilateral adenopathy and coarse reticular opacities. Okay. Uh, CT of the chest better demonstrates the extensive hilar and mediastinal adenopathy. Uh, so it's really important, uh, just as I know, to know where uh, if they're immigrating or coming from a different ethnicity, right? Like if they're coming for, from India, chances are they have TB in the question stem, okay? Because uh, that's what they use. Uh, for sarcoidosis, it's people from there. Uh, even Burkitt's uh, is usually for in, uh, from African communities. If they're going to South America, it's usually a traveler's diarrhea that you deal with, right? Uh, so it really, you need to look out for that. Like tropics will cause uh, West Nile or malaria and all that. Uh, in Africa, it's about malaria as well, but they have sickle cell as well. Okay. Uh, so pay attention to those clues as well. 
so okay so chest x-ray shows um, better demonstrates the extensive hyalur and mediastinal adenopathy right so this is the hilum and you see how all the nodes are uh, enlarged over here so that's the hyalur adenopathy okay uh, it shows bilateral adenopathy and coarse reticular opacities so right here you see the opacity is increased right now but at the hyalur uh, you see right here it's uh, basically telling you that there's bilateral adenopathy over there okay uh, so if you see enlarged lymph nodes and they tell you that it's uh, there's uh, serum level is increased or elevated CD4 CD8 ratio in bronchial lavage uh, fluid it's going to be sarcoidosis usually you just figure it out from this or from this we'll do that Associated with uh, Bell's palsy, uveitis, granulomas, non caseating epithelioid. Uh, this is like a buzzword for sarcoidosis. Because if they tell you that there's non caseating granuloma, uh, that should clue it down to, you know, uh, the sarcoidosis, Crohn's, uh, Berylosis, Bartonella. Depend and leprosy too. Uh, these are usually the ones that they go after. Uh, so depending on the system that uh, they're talking about, uh, you can just, you know, pick an answer related to that. Okay, so it's very important. Non-casing epithelioid containing microscopic shaman and asteroid uh, bodies. Lupus uh, perineo, perineo skin lesions on face resembling lupus, interstitial fibrosis, restrictive lung disease, erythema nodosum, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, like arthropathy, and most importantly, hypercalcemia, right? So there's increase in ACE level as well as calcium level. Why? It's because of the increase in 1-alpha hydroxylase. This is the one that converts cancer calcidiol to calcitriol or inactivated vitamin D to activated vitamin D, right? Uh, so due to increase in 1-alpha hydroxylase, mediated vitamin D activation in macrophages. It's associated with granulomas, non-caseating epithelioid, containing microscopic shaman and asteroid bodies, rheumatoid-like arthritis, uh, sorry, rheumatoid arthritis-like arthropathy. There's increase in calcium, ocular uveitis, interstitial fibrosis, and vitamin D activation due to increase in 1-alpha hydroxylase in macrophages. Skin changes, for example, lupus and erythema nodosum. Uh, usually, this is the one they give you with the vitamin D, the calcium, and the ACE level. And then they tell you that there is a non-granular, non-caseating granuloma. And they'll tell you that it's a middle-aged man, uh, female, right? Uh, I don't think they mention the race anymore. Uh, so pinpoint all of this pinpoints to sarcoidosis. The treatment is glucocorticoids if uh, they're symptomatic. Okay, inhalation injury and sequelae. Uh, this is complication of inhalation of noxious uh, nauseous uh, stimuli, for example, smoke uh, caused by heat particulates uh, less than one microgram uh, micrometer diameter or irritants for example ammonium ammonia right in each three uh, this causes chemical tracheobronchitis edema pneumonia and ERDS uh, many patients present secondary to burn uh, CO inhalation uh, cyanide poisoning or arsenic poisoning so the question stem is going to have this, the singed nasal hair or suit in oropharynx, uh, common on exam. What is suit? Uh, it's usually, I think it's the black stuff that comes out when you burn something. Um, that's called suit. And then singed hair is because of, uh, you know, burning like thing to the hair. That's what singed nasal hair would look like. Okay, uh, bronchoscopy shows severe edema, congestion of bronchus, 
and suit deposition. Uh, so this is 18 hours after inhalation uh, injury and then this is uh, after it's resolved. So resolution at 11 days after injury. Cool. Next. Uh, pneumoconiosis. Uh, so now we're going to talk about these uh, important. This is also the one that I was talking about, virulosis with a non-cascading granuloma. Okay, uh, important to know this, all of these and the buzzwords and everything about that so you can get it right. So pneumoconiosis, asbestos is from the roof, was common in insulation, but it affects the base. Okay, uh, yeah, so let's do this, how do we do that? And silica, coal, and berries are from the base, but affect the roof, upper lobes. Asbestos-related disease. Asbestos ca causes asbestosis or pulmonary fibrosis, pleural disease, malignancy, associated with shipbuilding, roofing, plumbing, ivory white, calcified, supra, and diaphragmatic, A, right? Uh, these things. Uh, and pleural uh, plaques on pathognomic are pathognomic. Uh, know this that it looks like this, uh, and if something looks like pearls, uh, ivory pearls, uh, and lungs, it's asbestos. Also, know the pleural plaques. Okay, so let's look at that. so when they're talking about pleural plaques they're uh, over here and here right so now if you cut this open and look at it from the top this is what you see right so when you start seeing these things uh, these contrasts uh, they're known as pleural plaques okay the plaques are the ones that are shining and this is a buzzword or a classic presentation of asbestosis. So if you see this, if you see an x-ray like this and you're looking and trying to figure out, don't forget to look at the corners. And if you start seeing this, it's going to be asbestosis. Okay, right here as well. Right, the pleural plaque over there, that, 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 and that. Um, they might not give you the photo, but they'll describe it. They'll tell you that there are some kind of uh, opacities found on the margins or something like that. Or they might tell you pleural plaques. Okay. Either way, it's going to be asbestosis, so know about that. Risk of bronchogenic carcinoma. More than risk of mesothelioma. There's increased risk of Kaplan syndrome, rheumatoid arthritis, and pneumoconiosis with intrapulmonary nodules. Okay, for this you need to know what Kaplan syndrome is. I think they tell you down here somewhere. Uh, not, let's just, oh, there it is, <laughs> my bad. Okay, so there's increased risk of Kaplan syndrome, which is rheumatoid arthritis and pneumoconiosis with intrapulmonary nodules. Rheumatoid arthritis and pneumoconiosis with intrapulmonary nodules. This is Kaplan syndrome. Uh, it affects the lower lobes, asbestos. Uh, Pharyngeous bodies are golden brown, fusiform rods resembling dumbbells. Okay. Uh, like that. If you see this, it's asbestos. Cool. Uh, found in alveolar sputum sample, um, visualized using Persian blue stain, often obtained by bronchioalveolar lavage. Increased risk of pleural effusion. Need to know this as well about asbestos and all of these. Okay. Uh, they give you three photos for one topic and only one between the others, so you know this is important. Um, Berylosis. Is associated with exposure to barium in aerospace and manufacturing industry. The question stems 
Oh yeah, for asbestos, the question stand is gonna have a person who is working in an office building, and then a uh, couple of people in the office started having symptoms. And uh, what could the culprit be? It's going to be asbestos, okay? Because uh, it was used in old buildings uh, for roofing and plumbing and all that stuff. Or it could be because of shipbuilding as well. If they tell you that this person works on ships and they make ships, uh, it should point towards this. For berylosis, it's about aerospace and rockets and all that stuff. Okay, uh, and manufacturing industries. So associated with exposure to beryllium in aerospace and manufacturing industries. Granulomatose, uh, non-caseating, that's D on histology and therefore occasionally responsive to glucocorticoids there's increased risk of cancer and core pulmonale okay. it affects upper lobes uh, yeah for this one they'll give you that there's uh, the person is working in aerospace uh, and uh, there's a non caseating granuloma so that should hint to berylosis. And if they talk about the def uh, lesion, it's going to be at the top, right? Uh, or upper lobe. Okay. Increased risk of cancer and core pulmonale. They might have uh, right ventricle hypertrophy. Okay. Uh, cold worker pneumoconiosis, prolonged uh, cold dust exposure. Well, it will lead to macrophage lane with carbon okay so that's the thing they tell you that there are macrophages found inside the sample from the uh, obtained from the lung and it has like uh, black low black debris inside of it or something black in it uh, it's carbon uh, this leads to inflammation and fibrosis it's also called the black lung disease uh, there is increased risk of Kaplan syndrome. Kaplan syndrome again was the rheumatoid arthritis and pneumoconiosis with intrapulmonary nodules. It affects the upper lung lobes, small rounded nodular opacities seen on imaging. Anthracosis, that's asymptomatic condition found in many urban dwellers exposed to sooty air. Uh, for that, they're going to tell you that they work in coal or something. If not coal, some kind of mine. Okay, but you remember, you need to know that the mine is about the coal, because there are other mines like sandblasting or foundries or mines that are uh, that causes silicosis, or you can get silicosis from that. So it has to be coal for that one. Uh, but normally they don't tell you anything. Uh, this person uh, has macrophage lane with, uh, with something black in it and that should tell you it's this because they have the black lung disease. Uh, silicosis associated with sandblasting foundries, mines. Macrophages respond to silica and release fibrogenic factors leading to fibrosis. It is thought that silica may disrupt phagolysosome and impair macrophages, increasing susceptibility to uh, TB, increased risk of cancer, core pulmonale, and Kaplan syndrome. Okay, uh, here they'll tell you uh, this as the buzzword: eggshell uh, calcification on hilar lymph node on chest X-ray. So for that, you need to know what this looks like. Okay, so they look like eggshells, basically, like that. And that's silicosis. Eggshell, eggshell, eggshell. Eggshell, eggshell, eggshell. In the hilar lymph nodes. Right. 
this one's good so die right there 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 okay yeah uh, it affects the upper lobes uh, and yeah so again it is thought that the silica may disrupt the phagolysosomes and impair macrophages increasing susceptibility to tuberculosis okay uh, TB is associated with silicosis because of this uh, you need to know this mechanism right here and uh, the question stem might tell you that the person works with sand a lot or they blast sand so the sand blasting is basically what they do uh, when they're polishing marble and stuff like that okay, so that's called sand blasting okay uh, next on to mesothelioma so non casein granuloma you need to know what granuloma looks like okay uh, mesothelioma uh, that's there uh, malignancy of the pleura associated with asbestosis may result in hemorrhagic pleural effusion exudative right, uh, pleural thickening see that histology may show somoma bodies uh, electron microscope may show polygonal tumor cells with microvilli, uh, desmosomes or tonofilaments, calretinin, and cytokeratin 5 to 10 positive in almost all mesotheliomas, and there's negative uh, or yeah negative in most carcinomas. And tobacco smoking is not a risk factor. So one thing you need to know that this one is. Uh, risk of bronchogenic carcinoma is higher with the asbestos uh, than the risk of mesothelioma okay so if you have asbestos related disease chances are it's going to turn into bronchogenic carcinoma uh, and less chances of turning into mesothelioma that's number one number two is right here they'll tell you that there's uh the sample is positive for cal uh, retinin or cytokeratin uh, for mesothelioma but if they tell you it's negative for these calretinin or cytokeratin or just keratin or anything uh, it's hinting towards the bronchogenic carcinoma and not mesothelioma okay that's how you differentiate between the two and the question stem uh, they might or might not give you this so don't depend on it the somoma bodies as well but if they give you somoma bodies and they tell you it's uh, there's pleural thickening, it's going to be mesothelioma. But this can happen in carcinoma as well. Okay. So you need to learn how to differentiate between the two in the question. Uh, on to ARDS. Uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome. This is important. It's the question stem is going to have that this patient was normal uh, two days ago when he was in the emergency department but now he's uh, having difficulty in breathing and chances are they're gonna die or they died af uh, soon after they visited the ER okay uh, pathophysiology is alveolar insult will lead to release of pro-inflammatory cytokines okay uh, this leads to neutrophil recruitment activation and release of toxic mediators for example reactive oxygen species proteases and etc this leads to capillary endothelial damage and increase in vessel permeability this will cause leakage of protein rich uh, fluids into alveoli uh, which leads to formation of intraalveolar hyaline membrane this is important this is what they will tell you that there is uh, the uh, hyaline membrane or s uh, some kind of thing uh, on the membrane okay and non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema normal pec cell volume uh, sorry normal capillary wedge pressure uh, which leads to decrease in compliance and VQ mismatch right because there's problem with the diffusion and uh, this leads to hypoxic vasoconstriction which leads to increase in pulmonary vascular resistance 
Peer's loss of surfactant also contributes to alveolar collapse. Okay, so this mechanism, uh, I think there is a photo for it. Okay, I guess, no, there's a better one in U world. This is the one. I can get it. Okay. Okay. So alveolar insult happens, right? So this is the normal alveoli, right? Uh, this is interstitium, uh, type one uh, pneumocyte, the squamous cell, uh, the alveolar macrophage the cuboidal cell is the type 2 pneumocyte okay so uh, when there's some kind of insult or damage or something introduced uh, that initiates the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines the flow inflammatory cytokines are interleukin 1 6 and tnf right so uh, the macrophages get activated they release all of these inter interleukins and tnf to recruit more uh, of this stuff in here, right? So they come in, uh, proteases, leukotrienes, and ROS, right? Okay, so neutrophil recruitment also happens. Uh, that's the neutrophil recruitment right there. That's It happens through the PCAM, uh, transmargination, and then the migration, right? or transmigration to migration okay uh, the capillary endothelial damage happens okay so since this is the interstitium and uh, look how big that got right uh, and this part of the area the outer area the highline membrane thickened thickened uh, highline membrane right uh, Okay, so capillary endothelial damage. So the thing they usually ask you about is what causes this. Uh, they'll give you this. So the next thing that causes is this, right? Uh, release of pro-inflammatory cytokines, okay, from macrophages. If that's not in the option, then it's going to be this. Neutrophils caused it from the recruitment. Or if that's not the answer, it, you keep going down the line, right? Uh, so you need to know this whole thing. The whole process uh, and release of toxic mediators for example reactive oxygen species protease etc leads to capillary endothelial damage okay uh, this is the endothelium or in endothelium right of the capillary right there leakage of protein rich fluid in, in into alveoli okay so all this fluid gets leaked into here see how there's no fluid here but here there's this yellow fluid. So that's the thing that causes acute respiratory distress. Okay, uh, so leakage of pro protein rich uh, fluid into alveoli, formation of intraalveolar highline membrane, uh, and non cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Uh, normal uh, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, or you know, the pressure in left atrium. Uh, this leads to decrease in compliance. So it's gonna fill up, uh, since it's filled up, uh, there's, uh, so how do I explain this? So if, the, when the air and gases come in, it's gonna get stuck over here, right? In this area where there's no fluid, but it's gonna have a hard time to pass through. Or not only because of this, but also because the interstitium is, you know, so high. And the uh, endothelial damage, as well and also because there's highline membrane so it's nearly impossible to get air exchange hanger from here to here right uh, okay so this causes the 
weak Q mismatch and hypoxic vasoconstriction. So now this whole capillary is going to get vasoconstricted so the blood gets uh, diverted to the parts that don't have the damage. Okay, this all causes increase in vascular, uh, pulmonary vascular resistance. Loss of surfactant also contributes to alveolar collapse. Okay, uh, okay, so causes are sepsis, this is the most common one uh, and the most important one, aspiration pneumonia, trauma, and pancreatitis. Diagnosis is uh, diagnosis of exclusion with the following criteria. Okay. So you need abnormal chest x-ray for ARDS. So A for abnormal chest x-ray, bilateral uh, lung opacities. Okay. Here you station tube right there. This is the right internal jugular line. The diffuse opacities. Uh, this is classic presentation for ARDS diffuse opacities okay uh, then you have respiratory failure within one week of alveolar insult they'll tell you this that it's within like three days ago the patient uh, had, was normal when he came into ER and today he's having this he came in for uh, treatment of sepsis and then he was okay and then he left right but then after like uh, four or five days or six days or even seven comes in well uh, with respiratory failure that's because he's going through ARDS okay uh, there's decrease in partial pressure or oxygen and oxygen in the inspired air as well uh, or FiO2 uh, that's the ratio is less than 300 hypoxemia due to increase in intrapulmonary uh, shunting and diffusion abnormalities it's both of these causes that are causing hypoxemia Symptoms of respiratory failure are not due to heart failure or fluid overload. Okay, they'll tell you the the cardiac markers are cleared. Uh, there is no problem with the heart. Like they'll tell you, there's increase in heart rate, but uh, other than that, every yeah, ECG is normal. You know. So consequences like there will be tacky, but everything else is okay. Uh, consequences are impaired gas exchange, decrease in lung compliance, and pulmonary hypertension. Management is treat the underlying cause, mechanical ventilation. In view, this is important. One, you decrease the tidal volume, right? Because you don't want to expand it and cause more damage. And because there's no point to that. But what is point to point? The point is to. Uh, Decrease the lung volume or tidal volume, right? So less amount of air comes in and chances are they'll get exchanged wherever there's possible. Like if the fluid is down here and this part is okay, then the air can get out there. But then you don't want so much air coming in that that's causing a problem as well. Okay. So tidal volume less and then increasing positive expiratory uh, and pressure okay so after expiration well the volume is down here where'd it go okay this thing right so during expiration it's down here right so what you do with PEP is that this thing comes up here okay and that's how you, know, you introduce the pressure or like this alveolar pressure right here so during expiration it's going from here to here, right? So this is the end of expiration. So rather than it ending over here, it's going to end somewhere up here in the positive. Okay, and that's what PEP is. And we do that only for two things. One is this, and the other is if there's collapse. Okay. And also, I think you do it for... Oh yeah, uh, no, you give CPAP for uh, apnea, okay? Uh, so it keeps the alveoli open during expiration, so it doesn't collapse. Uh, sleep apnea, no, right here. Uh, it's repeated cessation of breathing more than 10 seconds during sleep. 
okay uh, so when you have 10 seconds of uh, cessation of breathing what happens is it disrupt uh, causes disrupted sleep and daytime somnolence. okay actually I was thinking of this thing but we'll cover that okay so it causes disrupted sleep daytime somnolence. diagnosis confirmed by sleep study nocturnal hypoxia uh, leads to a systemic and pulmonary hypertension <coughs> Sorry. Uh, systemic and pulmonary hypertension, arrhythmias, atrial fibrillation, and flutter sudden death. Hypoxia leads to increase in EPO release, uh, and which causes increase in uh, erythropoiesis, right? So increase in hematocrits and all that you'll have. Okay, so now uh, there are two types of sleep apnea. Uh, one is obstructive sleep apnea and second is central sleep apnea. Okay. Uh, respiratory effort against airway. So obstructive sleep apnea. The respiratory effort against airway obstruction. Partial pressure of oxygen is usually normal during the day. Okay. So respiratory effort against area obstruction okay so let's do that you know face with the that's a bad face do the sleeping with the nose and this is the mouth with the pharynx larynx and trachea Whatever. So just this is the mouth, okay? These are lips. Okay, and this is the eye. And just pretend like this is a perfect drawing to understand this. If you believe it, it will happen. <laughs> uh, respiratory efforts against airway obstruction, okay? So normally what happens, um, this is due to the adenoids or the tongue, uh, hyperplasia under the tongue, uh, the muscles under the tongue, because of some reason, or because the tongue is collapsing um, backwards, which is causing the obstruction, okay? So when it's obstructed, uh, what's gonna happen is your diaphragm is gonna go downwards, causing increase in suction in the lungs, which causes further obstruction as well. So respiratory effort against RV obstruction. Uh, PO2 is usually normal during the day because you're aware, right? So it's associated with obesity, loud snoring, and daytime sleepiness. Uh, usually caused by excessive uh, excess parapharyngeal or oropharyngeal tissues in adults. Adenoid tonsillar hypertrophy in children. So in adults, it's because of parapharyngeal and oropharyngeal tissues, like the muscles uh, under the tongue. And then for children, it's adenoid tonsillar hypertrophy in children. Okay, uh, treatment is weight loss. Uh, CPAP, dental tissue uh, devices, and hypoglossal nerve stimulation, and upper airway surgery. Okay, so Either the muscles are, you know, hyperplasia of that, or there's fat deposition under the tongue that also causes it. Okay. Uh, central sleep uh, apnea, impaired respiratory effort due to CNS injury or toxicity, congestive heart failure, opioids. They all cause central sleep apnea. This may be associated with shine stoke uh, respiration. This is oscillation between apnea and hyperapnea so apnea is uh, normal breathing uh, sorry decrease in breathing right so see this is normal uh, apnea is going to be like this and then hypo uh, hyperapnea is wait no I got that wrong okay so apnea is no breathing right and then uh, hyperapnea is hyper breathing so like that 
I think there should be a chart of that. Let's look at that. A diagram for transfer frustration. Because they just give you that. You don't have to worry about anything else. If you know what it looks like, you can just memorize that. Okay. So it's going to be this uh, with irregular respiration. Okay, so this is shine stove. So that's apnea with no breathing, and then hyperapnea with the breathing. No breathing, breathing. No breathing, breathing. That's called shine stove, and shine stove is uh, uh, respiration is a sign of central sleep apnea. Okay, uh, so for obstructive sleep apnea, they'll say that the person uh, is always sleepy during the daytime. Uh, the wife says that he snores a lot. Uh, he may be obese, but not more than uh, BMI is not going to be more than 30. Okay. Uh, yeah, so all of this, uh, daytime sleepiness and all of this uh, points towards obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, for central sleep apnea, uh, you do a test, sleep test, right? Uh, you check and all that stuff. Uh, and you find out that there is shine stoke respiration or they tell you that then you know it's sleep uh, central sleep apnea okay majority of the time it's going to be this if uh, it if they don't give you any of this then you go to thinking about this one okay and then there is obesity hypoventilation syndrome this is an easy one they'll tell you that the bmi is more than 30 if they give you that it's this Okay, also called Pickwickian uh, syndrome. Uh, obesity is this. It causes hypoventilation, which leads to increase in PaCO2 during waking hours or retention. Okay, so there's so much fat on the respiratory muscles and all that, right? So they have a hard time uh, going against it. They already had to go against the inertia. Now they go against the buildup of that as well, the heavy weight. Okay, so what happens is there is decreased amount of ventilation compared to normal. Okay, uh, this leads to increase in uh, carbon dioxide partial pressure in the arteries during waking hours due to retention, and decrease in uh, oxygen partial pressure and uh, carbon dioxide partial pressure increases during sleep. Uh, treatment is weight loss and positive airway pressure okay cool uh, for this one uh, they'll tell you that this person has high carbon dioxide in the arteries um, for the partial pressure even during waking hours uh, that's going to be in the question stem as well as that uh, BMI is more than 30 so they'll tell you what is this apnea because of it's because of this obstruct uh, obesity hypoventilation syndrome pulmonary hypertension it's elevated mean pulmonary artery pressure more than 20 mmg at rest it results in arteriosclerosis um, medial hypertrophy intima fibrosis of pulmonary arteries and plexiform lesions increase in pulmonary vascular resistance um, which leads to right ventricle high uh, pressure, which leads to uh, RVH and RV failure. Um, this is just something uh, that's, you know, common and pretty easy to understand. Uh, so within the vessels in the endothelium, you have a little muscle, right? Uh, and the muscle basically just like any other muscle if you push it too hard it's gonna develop hyper uh, it's gonna get you know bigger and hypertrophy trophy is the size one right because you want a bigger trophy so when the pressure pushes onto it because of the increased uh, pulmonary artery pressure uh, the muscles are gonna grow bigger and bigger right so now the muscle from that became to this instead of just that right and 
it's on both sides so as uh, the pressure increases this gets bigger and bigger eventually this is going to cause stenosis of that right and that's what re renal artery stenosis happens uh, that's how it happens in hypertension uh, that's why hypertension is bad <clears throat> um, okay so it results in arteriosclerosis and medial uh, hypertrophy and intimal fibrosis of pulmonary artery okay and then that's how you get the fibrosis in the intimal part of the artery and plexiform region increase in vascular resistance leads to all of this etiologies pulmonary arterial hypertension often idiopathic of females more than males heritable uh, PAH can be uh, that's uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension so heritable pulmonary arterial hypertension can be due to an inactivating mutation in the BMPR2 gene normally inhibits vascular smooth muscle proliferation uh, So since this is the one that inactivates smooth muscle proliferation, if that's, this gets inhibited, then this gets disinhibited and causes the proliferation. Right? Uh, pulmonary vasculature endothelial dysfunction results in increase in vas vasoconstriction or constrictors, for example, endothelin, and decrease in vasodilators, for example, NO and prostacyclins. Other causes include systolic diastolic dysfunction and valvular disease right uh, sorry no that was here i got zoned out sorry other causes include drugs for example amphetamines and cocaine connective tissue disease uh, hiv infection portal hypertension congenital heart disease and schistosomiasis okay and left heart disease it's cause uh it causes in in include uh, systolic diastolic dysfunction and valvular disease lung diseases or hypoxia that cause pulmonary hypertension destruction of lung parenchyma for example COPD lung inflammation fibrosis for example interstitial lung disease hypoxemic vasoconstriction for example obstructive sleep dyspnea and living in high altitude uh, chronic thromboembolic uh, pulmonary hypertension and it's recurrent microthrombi which leads to decrease in cross-sectional area of vascular pulmonary vascular bed and multifactorial causes include hemorrhagic systemic and metabolic disorders along with compression uh, compression of the pulmonary vascular chair of by a tumor uh, know this on the pathophysiology of that and that way this is you don't have to memorize these because then it just makes sense <clears throat> another thing in this so you gotta remember this thing so pulmonary vasculature endothelial dysfunction results in this increase in vasoconstrictor and decrease in vasodilators okay uh, on to physical findings in select lung diseases Abnormality of breath sounds, percussion, uh, fremitus, and tracheal deviation. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, nothing. That okay. So, abnormality of uh, breath sounds, percussion, and fremitus. That's the vibration. Uh, you hear uh, through the body tracheal deviation okay. so pleural effusion that's uh, build-up build of fluid uh, lining the lung and the chest uh, breath sounds will decrease in that. almost everywhere breath sound is decreased so you don't have to memorize that uh, only place where it increases is consolidation Okay, so if they mention there's increase in breath sounds, it's consolidation. Otherwise, uh, it's weak, so you don't focus on that.
unless it's increased. Okay, so that uh, percussion is dull. Uh, it's usually dull. It's only hyper uh, hyper resonant and simple pneumothorax or tension pneumothorax when there's air involved. Okay, so if there's air involved, it's gonna be hyper resonant. Otherwise, it's dull. Okay. Uh, then you have vocal fremitus. It's all decreased except for consolidation. It's increased in consolidation. Okay. Uh, and tracheal deviation. So pleural effusion. Uh, none if small. But if it's more, so that's basically you know. You have lung over here, lung over here, and the trachea over here, right? So if this gets bigger, uh because of buildup of fluid in the pleura. If this gets bigger, that's going to push this this way, right? So that's tracheal deviation shifting to the right. Okay? So if you have tracheal deviation, uh you need to know which one causes away from the lesion and towards the lesion. Right? Uh so when it's toward the lesion, it's usually because of atelectasis or lung collapse right so if this is collapsed right away like that the suction is going to pull this towards this right uh, so that's a tracheal deviation towards the lesion but if it was the, because of this then it's uh, away from the lesion right so away from the side of the lesion if large uh, you have simple pneumothorax red sounds is decreased hyper resonant Oh, actually, atelectasis, again, breath sound is decreased, percussion is dull, fremitus is uh, reduced as well. However, the tracheal deviation is towards the side of the lesion, so this is the deciding factor between the two. Simple pneumothorax decreased here, the deciding factor is this, uh, right, simple pneumothorax, uh, and tracheal deviation doesn't happen in this. Uh, however, in tension pneumothorax, there is tracheal deviation, and that's the deciding factor between the two. And uh, consolidation, lobar pneumonia, pulmonary edema. Bronchial breath sounds, late inspiratory crackles, egophony, and whispered pectoral creep. Okay, percussion is dull, fremitus is increased, and tracheal deviation doesn't happen. So here, this is the one that helps you differentiate between the others. If there's increase in breath sounds. And increase in breath sounds are late inspiratory crackles, egophony, or whispered pectoral creep. Okay. Uh, digital clubbing. This is very important. Sometimes they just give you these findings. And then you have to figure out from that which one of these is the abnormality. Digital clubbing increase angle between nail bed and nail plate. Okay, that's like this. So, from the side, it, yeah, this is the finger, and you have a nail that's like this. Okay, so this thing is gonna become like that. Okay, so instead of that, it's going to be this. Okay, and that's clubbing. So increase angle between the nail bed and the nail plate. Okay, right there. Uh, so more than uh, 180 degrees. Okay, that was 180, and now this angle right here. It's increased. Or wait, actually not that one. This one, I think. The angle right there. That they're talking about. Okay. Uh, pathophysiology, not well understood. So that's cool. And patients with intrapulmonary shunt, 
platelet and megakaryocytes become lodged in digital vasculature, right? So in intrapulmonary shunt, the theory is that the platelets and megakaryocyte, they travel towards the extremities and then they get lodged in the digital vasculature. And then uh, there's a local release of platelet-derived growth factors and uh, VEGF and that will cause NGO or whatever angiogenesis or whatever right uh, it can be hereditary or uh, acquired causes include respiratory diseases uh, for example idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis cystic fibrosis bronchiectasis and lung cancer cardiovascular diseases for example cyanotic congenital heart disease uh, infection for example, lung abscess or tuberculosis and others, for example, IBD. Uh, not typically associated with COPD or asthma. So if you have this, it's not that. But chances are it's going to be this or lung cancer for pulmonary causes. Right. Uh, so you can see it there or you can see it in congenital heart disease, cyanotic ones. Okay. Uh, lung abscess and TB does it and this as well. This is inflammatory bowel disease. Okay. Uh, atelectasis, alveolar collapse, right upper lobe collapse against mediastinum. Uh, okay. So, yeah, so alveolar collapse, right upper lobe. So you have, this is important to understand that it doesn't have to be the whole lung. Right, so you have uh, left lung and then you have right lung. And then this lung. Right. So that makes up the lung. So when it's collapsing, let's make this, we don't need that. Just pretend like this is the right lung. So when it collapses, it could be just one of the lobes that collapses, right? So when this is collapsed, you'll have tracheal deviation towards that, right? Like that. Okay, so alveolar collapse, right upper lobe collapse against the mediastinum. Okay, so mediastinum is in the middle, right? This area right here. Uh, multiple causes, obstructive. Airway obstruction prevents new air from reaching distal airways. Old air is reabsorbed, okay? so. When it's doing this, uh, new air can't go into it, right? And whatever the air air that's left over it will get reabsorbed. And okay, so obstructive. Uh, okay, so see, it's like this, and then it has arteries going into it, right? And into this, this is the hilum, right? So if there is a low mass that's obstructing this, what's gonna happen? New air does not go in right sorry not i said blood vessels but that's like the airways so new air can't go in and the old air that was already in here is going to get reabsorbed okay and this is called obstructive uh cause of atelectasis so obstructive is airway obstruction prevents new air from reaching distal airways old air is reabsorbed for example foreign body mucus plug or tumor uh, compressive is so mucus plug could be because of uh, chronic bronchitis as well uh, okay compressive is external uh, yeah external right uh, sorry external compression of lung disease lung volumes for example space occupying lesions and pleural effusion Okay, so external, whatever may the cause be, like uh, some lesion or pleural effusion, right? So pleural effusion causes compression on some lobe uh, that will cause compressive atelectasis. Then you have contraction or sisterization. Uh, this is scarring of the lung parenchyma that distorts alveoli. For example, sarcoidosis. And then the fourth kind is adhesive. This is due to the lack of surfactant, for example, NRDS in premature 
babies. Okay. Uh, remember sarcoidosis, increase in ACE, calcium, middle-aged, uh, vitamin D, uh, due to increase in one half for hydroxylase from mitochondria, uh, sorry, macrophages, right? Okay. Uh, adhesive is due to lack of surfactant, uh, and that causes uh, NRDS and premature release. Uh, so you have obstruction over here that's causing uh, atelectasis of this lobe right here. This is the pleura, this is the parenchyma. In pleura effusion, uh, you have compression happening at the bottom lung, right? So you have pleura effusion air or tumor pushing against it, causing, you know, shifting or trachea this way as well. Uh, they usually don't give you that in the questions then, so you have to figure out what it is. Is this consolidation or is it pleural effusion? Okay, uh, what you will see is blunting of the claustrophrenic angle, right? Because normally this is what the claustrophrenic angle is that you see in the chest x ray, right? But now this is uh, taken over by this pleural effusion, so you won't see that area. So this area is going to have a blunted effect. Okay. Uh, then you have, this is compressive. Uh, so pure effusion. Then you have uh, contraction uh, or sisterization, right? Uh, or scarring. And then you have adhesive. This is due to the lack of surfactant. Looks similar to the contraction one. And it's because of lack of surfactant. Okay, uh, pleural effusion. This is the excess accumulation of fluid between the pleural layers, uh, causing restricted lung expansion during inspiration. It can be treated with thoracic synthesis to remove, reduce, remove or reduce fluid, uh, like that. Okay, so. This is pre-treatment and then this is post-treatment. Okay, so it's clear. Pre-treatment again, it's this. And then this is post-treatment. So you see how there is blunting of costophrenic angle right there. And this is a normal costophrenic angle right there, right? So it's blunted. That's how you read the x-ray for this. Okay, now, uh, okay. So excess accumulation of fluid between the pleural Layer restricted lung expansion during inspiration can be treated with thoracosynthesis to remove or reduce the fluid. Um, based on the lights criteria, fluid is consistent with uh, an exudate if pleural fluid protein serum protein uh, sorry serum protein is more than 0 0.5 and pleural fluid LDH or serum LDH is more than 0 0.6. Not or it's over. This is a ratio, right? So uh, I'll talk about it. So, or uh, pl plural fluid LDH is more than two thirds upper limit of normal serum LDH. Okay, so basically, what you're doing is you're checking for protein if this is the lung, right? And then you have the whole body, right? And that's the face. I know why I gave made him a dog. Got a little nose. <laughs> Anyways, so what we are checking is uh, how much protein is in this fluid right here in the lungs compared to the protein in the serum, right? So if uh, there is more protein over here, you'll have increase, right? Increase the top number. So pleural fluid protein divided by serum protein, which will have a lower number. That means it's gonna be more than 0 0.5, right? Normally the ratio is one over two, but now if you have two over uh, two or three over two, that's more than 0 0.5, right? So that makes it an exudative uh, pleural effusion. Exudative happens because of uh, all of these reasons, uh, infection and all that stuff. And transudative 
is going to be if the protein is still, you know, more in the serum than this, it's going to be less than 0 0.5. So that makes it transudative. And these are usually due to non infectious or inflammatory causes. Okay. Uh, with the flu fluoral fluid LDH and serum LDH, same thing. You're checking uh, LDH of here, this, because neutrophils release LDH, right? Uh, so if there's increase of this uh, LDH here compared to the this, that's going to be a bigger number than 0 0.6. And that means it's exudative. Or pleural fluid LDH. Uh, that has to be more than two third of the upper limit of the normal serum LDH. Okay. So these are the numbers you should remember 0 0.6 for LDH and 0 0.5 for uh, serum protein or protein. So if the number is higher than 0 0.5, it's exudative. If the number is uh, for LDH is more than 0 0.6, it's exudative. That also means if it's lower, it's transudative. Okay. Uh, for the pleural effusion. So exudative causes are, okay, so exudative or exudate. It's cloudy fluid, uh, cellular, due to infection, for example, pneumonia, tuberculosis, malignancy, connective tissue disease, lymphatic, chylothorax, trauma, okay, often requires drainage due to increased risk of infection. Uh, transudative or transudate is a clear fluid, uh, hypocellular, Okay, hypo, it doesn't have any neutrophils or WBCs or that kind of stuff. It's due to increase in hydrostatic pressure. For example, heart failure, uh, sodium retention, and or increase in, uh, sorry, decrease in oncotic pressure. For example, nephrotic syndrome and cirrhosis. Cool. So there's normal with the plasma proteins. Uh, in exudative, you have uh, neutrophils increasing your vascular permeability. Uh, so then uh, you have fluid, inflammatory cells, and protein leakage into the interstitial. Right? Uh, and in transudative, you have increased hydrostatic pressure right? Uh, because of sodium retention or heart failure. Uh, you are pushing the fluid outwards into the uh, into the interstitium, or you have decreased amount of oncotic pressure uh, in this, like nephrotic syndrome. So it's not holding on or pulling the fluid inward. So the net effect causes fluid to flow outwards into the interstitium, right? So decreased colloid oncotic pressure because of that. So these are the transudative causes. Okay, uh, pneumothorax, accumulation of air in pleural space like that, uh, accumulation of air in pleural space, uh, dyspnea, yeah. right, pneumothorax, accumulation of air in the pleural space, so air in the pleural space partially collapsed lung, uh, it's really hard to differentiate, uh, at least for me, when they give you an x-ray and you have to figure out if it's a collapsed lung or uh, pneumothorax, usually it's pneumothorax, and it's very rare they talk about uh, collapsed lung. So now after doing a few questions, I can figure it out, but it's really hard still. Accumulation of air in pleural space. Dyspnea, uneven chest expansion. Chest pain, uh, decrease in tactile fremitus, hyper resonance, and diminished breath sounds. All on the affected side. Uh, yeah. Uh, primary spontaneous pneumothorax due to rupture of apical subpleural pleb or cysts occurs more frequently, most frequently in tall than young males associated with tobacco smoking. Secondary spontaneous pneumothorax due to diseased lung, diseased lung, for example, bulla and emphysema, Marfan syndrome, or infections, mechanical and ventilation with use of high pressure. Uh, which is uh, which leads to bear trauma. Okay, uh, then there is traumatic pneumothorax. This is caused by blunt, uh, for example, rib fracture, 
penetrating, for example, gunshot or iatrogenic, for example, central line placement, lung biopsy and barrel trauma due to mechanical ventilation or trauma. There's uh, also tension pneumothorax. It can be from any of the above. Air enters pleural space but cannot exit. Increasing trapped air leads to tension pneumothorax. Trachea deviates away from the affected lung. Okay. Uh, this is important to know. That's an important distinction between also atelectasis and uh, pneumothorax. Right. Uh, may lead to increased intrathoracic pressure, which leads to mediastinal displacement, kinking of IVC, and this will cause decrease in venous return and decrease in cardiac output, and that causes the obstructive shock. Okay, so there would be a question stem about a person who was involved in a fight and he got stabbed, uh, and then there was he started having, uh, you know going into hypotension and shock. Uh, so you would think it's because of hypovolemic shock, but it's not hypovolemic shock, they tell you that. So it's obstructive shock because of this kinking causing obstruction in IVC. Okay, hypotension tachycardia, jugular venous distension, needs immediate needle decompression and chest tube placement. Cool. So tracheal uh, deviation this way so that means collapsed lung is on this side and pneumothorax is right here okay uh, pneumonia you need to know what uh, which organisms cause these uh, so type typical organism and characteristics lobar pneumonia uh, s pneumonia most common legionella and klebsiella characteristic is intraalveolar Exudate, and which causes uh, leads to consolidation. So this is consolidation. Okay, it's uh, confined to a lobe. Okay. So yeah, it's in the name, right? Lobar pneumonia. So it's confined to the lobe. And is caused by S pneumonia, Legionella, and Klebsiella. Okay. S pneumonia was the alpha hemolytic one. Right. Uh, Legionella is the AC one, the closed system, and Klebsiella was red current jelly. Sputum. Uh, Bronco pneumonia, S pneumonia, S aureus, H influenza, and Klebsiella. H influenza is the one with uh, epiglottitis, the tripod position in a child. Uh, S aureus is, you know, S aureus, and then Klebsiella again, same thing. Uh, characteristics is are uh, acute inflammatory infiltrates, for example, from bronchial into adjacent alveoli, patchy distribution involving more than one lobe. like that and this is the inflammatory infiltrates in the alveoli right so this is an alveoli right there and there's stuff inside it usually it's clear okay so this is called bronchopneumonia acute inflammatory infiltrates from the bronchioles into the adjacent alveoli patchy distribution involving more than one lobe cool then you have interstitial atypical pneumonia. This is mycoplasma, chlamydophilia pneumonia, uh, chlamydophilia sitaki, uh, legionella, coxiella berneti, uh, or berneti. Uh, viruses are RSV, that's respiratory syncytial virus, and that was in para, that's a paramyxal virus, I think. Yeah. Uh, then CMV, that's uh, herpes type 5, I think, 5, 6, yeah, 5. Uh, influenza is adenovirus, uh, sorry, influenza, that's uh, orthomyxal virus, and adenovirus, that's a DNA virus, okay. So interstitial pneumonia is diffuse patchy uh, inflammation located or localized to interstitial areas at alveolar walls 
Uh, chest x-ray shows bilateral multifocal opacities. Uh, generally follows a more indolent horse or walking pneumonia. Okay. Uh, that's a classic presentation for mycoplasma pneumonia, right? Or pneumonia. Uh, the walking pneumonia, it's when the chest x-ray is much worse than what the symptoms show. Uh, so they walk around with the pneumonia in their lungs and they don't even know about it. Only that. Cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, etiology unknown. Uh, there is a de uh, negative sputum and blood cultures, often re response to glucocorticoids, but not to antibiotics. Okay, formerly called the bronchiolitis obliterans, organizing pneumonia, or boop. <laughs> I'm sorry, sir. You have came down with a case of boop. Uh, Non-infectious pneumonia characterized by inflammation of bronchioles and surrounding structure. Uh, this is, uh, they'll probably tell you about this uh, involving a lung transplantation in the, as a chronic transplant rejection case. Okay, that's where you would see that. Uh, aspiration uh, pneumonia, aspiration of Aspiration of oropharyngeal or gastric content leads to pulmonary infection. Risk factors are altered mental status, uh, decrease in cough, reflex, and glottic closure. Dysphagia, neurologic disorders, for example, stroke. Invasive tubes, for example, nasogastric tube. It presents days after aspiration event in dependent lung segment more common in right lower lung if sitting up and right upper lung lobe sorry if uh, laying down due to bronchial anatomy it can progress to abscess okay uh, so aspiration pneumonitis this is it presents hours after aspiration event due to gastric acid mediated inflammation presents with infiltrates in the lower lobe and resolves with supportive treatment. Okay. Uh, so it's usually going to be someone who drinks a lot. That's what the case usually tells you. They don't tell you about the other ones. So this guy is found to have history of alcoholism and there's like a lung abscess or something. It's because of this. Okay. Uh, the culprits are your uh, anaerobic gram negative bacilli, right? So, bacteroids, um, peptobacilli, uh, fusiform, or fragilis, or I forgot the names, but it's, it's those weird ones, and also Klebsiella. But not Klebsiella, unless they tell you other stuff about it, then you have to pick the other ones, okay? Uh, natural history of lower pneumonia, uh, congestion, red hepatization, gray hepatization, and resolution. So days, one to two days, uh, the findings are red, purple, uh, partial consolidation of parenchyma, exudates most, uh, with mostly bacteria. Okay, so you have a normal and healthy lung right here with healthy alveolus, macrophages right there, and this is the capillary attached to it. Uh, that's involved in the gas exchange from this to this or this to this, right? Uh, it has a WBC in it, okay? This is normal in the capillary. Uh, so when you have congestion, uh, so some kind of insult happened here, right? Uh, what you get is exudate with mostly bacteria. So you have uh, WBC accumulating over here on this side and transmigrating towards this. Uh, right and going into here and then it does its thing so when it does that there's bacteria over here and exudate over here okay and causing congestion so congestion is usually red right so red purple partial consolidation of parenchyma exudate with mostly bacteria this is one to two days 
so after neutrophil what comes uh, macrophages right uh, red hepatization that's red brown consolidation exudates with fibrin bacteria rbc's wbc's these are still reversible right so uh, you already have macrophages there so they're not but they are like multiplying right now okay uh, they're still not functioning they're just accumulating I guess but there is fibrin happening here because of some kind of thing enrolling that basically you need to know uh, what you will find during what days and what stage of the uh, consolidation it's in and you should be able to differentiate between the stages okay uh, so bacteria RBCs WBCs and this is reversible over here okay RBC and fibrin WBC bacteria and gray hepatization this happens uh, at the end of the week near the end of the week five to seven days it's uniformly gray exudates full of WBCs now and lysed RBCs okay so the redness is gone because there's lysed RBC and it's more grayish because of the WBCs and fibrin fibrins are still there right then you have resolution uh, over eight days or over a week uh, this is enzymatic digestion of exudates by macrophages so that's where macrophages digest that so here they're just forming fibrin and stuff here you don't have fibrin so that start it's pretty early in the consolidation phase then you have fibrin then you have lysed RBCs and then you have exudates being digested by macrophages um, after eight days cool Lung abscess, yeah, so these are the ones I was talking about. The Fusobacterium, Bacteroids, and Peptostreptococcus, right? So this is what lung abscess is for, uh, I mean made of, or by. Localized con collection, collection of pus within parenchyma, uh, caused by aspiration of oropharyngeal contents, especially in patients predisposed to loss of consciousness, for example, alcohol overuse or epilepsy on bronchial obstruction for example cancer okay so it could be because of alcohol overuse it could be because of epilepsy this is important to remember that epilepsy will cause this as well and bronchial obstruction like cancer air fluid levels uh, right here Uh, often seen on chest x-ray presence suggests cavitation due to anaerobes like bacteroids fusobacterium and peptostreptococcus or SREs there is no Klebsiella okay. treatment is antibiotics uh, drainage or surgery lung abscess secondary to aspiration is most often found in the right lung Location depends on patient's position during aspiration. So if they're standing uh, or sitting, it's going to be right lower lobe, right? So it goes straight down here. Uh, and right upper lobe or middle lobe if recombinant. So if they're sleeping, it's going to go from here to here because the gravity is downwards here or up here. Right? Okay. Uh, lung cancer leading cause of cancer death presentation is cough hemoptysis bronchial obstruction wheezing so wheezing happens here as well mnemonic uh, coin lesion of chest x-ray or non-calcified nodules on ct they'll usually just tell you that this person is losing weight without you know trying so that's cancer then site of metastasis are from Lung cancer is liver, so jaundice or hepatomegaly, that's what you'll see. Adrenals, uh, bone, so pathologic fractures, and brain, so lung mets. Okay, in the lung, metastasis, uh, usually multiple lesions, are more common than primary neoplasms. Most often from breast, colon, prostate, and bladder cancer. 
sphere of complications superior vena cava thoracic outlet syndrome Pankow's tumor corner syndrome endocrine paraneoplastic uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve compression and effusion pleural or pericardial risk factors include tobacco smoking secondhand smoke radiation environmental exposure for example radon and asbestos this is the second most common uh, cause it's not given here is it no i don't see it okay so you need to know about radon uh, after smoking this is the most common cause of lung cancer and asbestos pulmonary fibrosis and family history so what happens is radon uh, it decays uh, and it, it, as it decays it drops down and uh, stays down there right because half-life is uh, long for these uh, it's used as uh, red poisoning or like you know to get rid of pests so when it's used in a house all the you know radon basically accumulates in the basement so if you live in the basement and someone's using radon above you, you have a chance of getting lung cancer because of that. Okay, uh, squamous and uh, small cell carcinomas are central. Okay, so SS is central, so and often caused by smoking. So when it's central, what you get is uh, you will get neural cells in the biopsy. So let's do small cell and then non-small cell. Okay, so small cells or old cells carcinoma are central. Okay, uh, undifferentiated uh, leads to, they're undifferentiated and very aggressive. May cause neurologic paraneoplastic syndrome. For example, Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome. Paraneoplastic myelitis, encephalitis, subacute cellular degeneration, and endocrine paraneoplastic syndrome. Uh, Cushing syndrome, CIAD. Amplification of mice oncogene common. Managed with chemotherapy with or without radiation. Okay, neoplasms of. Okay, so here uh, you need to know about this that it can cause this or mass uh, perineoplastic myelitis okay and then also that in because of this it's going to cause increase in ADH okay and ACTH as well okay so increase in ACTH and ADH for this Okay, for this, I have a note. Let me go back to this. Lung abscess. It says that neutrophil are key players in formation of lung abscess. It leads to lysosomal content being released by the neutrophil, causing the lung abscess as well. Okay. Uh, this one, uh, what you need to know is that it's aggressive, and they'll give you that there is an increase in ACTH or ADH. Another thing they can give you is any of these markers. So neoplasm of neuroendocrine uh, Kolchitsky cells will lead to small dark blue cells. Okay, so like oat. It's called the oat cells, right? So like that. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I think it's, they're talking about this one right here. Uh, chromogranin A positive, neuro spe neuron specific analyse positive, and synaptophysin positive. Okay, so if you get these, you know it's a central cancer, then you have to differentiate between the central cancers like this and this one. So this one is pretty rare, so you don't have to do that one. Okay. Uh, it's easy to do that because this one is going to be about keratin pearl. Wherever you see keratin pearls, it's going to be squamous cell carcinoma, right?
goes back. Then you have non-small cell carcinoma, so adenocarcinoma, peripheral. Most common primary lung cancer, most common subtype in people who do not smoke. More common in females than males. Okay. So you know how it says uh, most common subtype in people who do not smoke? That's true, but in the question stem, if they have adenocarcinoma, they might have a history of smoking, but like, you know, when they were younger. So like, for the past 20 years, they have not been smoking, something like that. Okay, and that's your adenocarcinoma. Uh, more common in females than males. Activating uh, mutations. Uh, so again, females than males, it's important. Uh, activating mutations include CRAS, EGFR, and ELK. That's adenoma of lung carcinoma, right? Uh, lungs or whatever. Uh, the CRAS was, remember, I made a face. So you do a K, R for lungs. And then for A was like this for the pancreas. And then I did an S for the colon, right? So that's CRAS and then EGFR, okay? So it's just EGFR. Okay, uh, it's associated with hypertrophic osteoarthropathy or clubbing. Uh, bronchial alveolar uh, subtype, adenocarcinoma in situ. Chest x-ray often shows hazy infiltrates Similar to pneumonia, better prognosis. Uh, histology is glandular pattern, often stains mucin positive. Okay. That. Uh, bronchial alveolar um, subtype grows along alveolar septa that leads to apparent thickening of alveolar walls. Tall columnar cells containing mucus. Uh, so this is important for this as well. They'll give you that uh, it has it's mucin positive. Okay. They'll give you that there's thickening of this, or they'll give you this by itself. Tall columnar cells containing mucus. And you should know that if there's anything to do with mucus, it's going to be adenocarcinoma. If you figured out that there's carcinoma, you know, and you know that from. This person's uh, coughing uh, with a 20 year history of no smoking and they're you know it's a female and they lose weight right? so that's how you know it's a lung cancer uh, okay so on to squamous cell carcinoma uh, this is central okay and there's a hyalur mass uh, you'll see it over there uh, arising from bronchus, cavitation, cigarettes, and hypercalcemia. Uh, what was egg calcification of hyalur lymph nodes? That was silicosis, right? Just gotta make sure. Yeah, eggshell calcification, okay. Okay. Uh, so hyalur arising from hyalur mass arising from bronchus so it, it's a mass in the bronchus and it's a hyalur that's going to be squamous cell carcinoma because usually you're going to have to differentiate between this and uh, sarcoidosis or some other mass okay even this so hyalur mass arising from bronchus cavitation and cigarettes and hypercalcemia okay hypercalcemia this also Sorry, uh, sarcoidosis also does this, right? Hypercalcemia. That's why you got the friendship between that. And then you have cavitations and cigarettes and hypercalcemia. So it produces uh, PTHRP, uh, right? So parathyroid hormone uh, like protein or whatever it was. Um, this is important because it shows up in this uh, squamous cell carcinoma of lung. And also renal cell carcinoma. Usually they talk about renal cell carcinoma when this shows up. But remember that it also happens because of squamous cell carcinoma. And this is the buzzword or, you know, presentation. Keratin pearls.
and intracellular bridges like desmosome uh, or you know that's what they're called desmosomes are intracellular bridges uh, large cell carcinoma this is peripheral highly anaplastic undifferentiated tumor strong association with uh, tobacco smoking may produce hcg uh, causing gynecomastia right so uh, they make large breasts in men and uh, because of high gonadotropin chorionic gonadotropin right human chorionic gonadotropin uh, less responsive to chemotherapy and removed surgically there's poor prognosis with large cell carcinoma uh, the marker is pleomorphic giant cells right so giant is a large cell carcinoma and that's what it looks like there uh, now uh, bronchial carcinoid tumor central or peripheral excellent prognosis metastasis is rare symptoms due to mass effect or coronoid uh, carcinoid syndrome okay so this is the one i was talking about okay so for this one metastasis is rare so it's rare that uh, this happens because of something in colon Symptoms due to mass effect or carcinoid syndrome, like flushing, diarrhea, or wheezing. Uh, you will find nests of neuroendocrine cells and chromogranin alpha A positive. Holy shit. Cool. Uh, Pancos tumor. Uh, this is important. They test you on this a lot. It's also called a superior sulcus tumor. Carcinoma that occurs in the apex of lungs. Uh, of the lung right so if this lung this the apex so may cause pancos syndrome by invading or compressing the local structures right so if you can imagine if there's a mass over here it's going to press everything around this area right or this area as well so the compression of local regional structures may cause array of findings which include recurrent laryngeal nerve or causing hoarseness, stellate ganglion uh, causing hornet syndrome, ipsilateral ptosis, meiosis and anhydrosis. That's because there's a nerve T2 going towards the fish, uh, facial muscles and all that stuff uh, to the uh, eyelids and you know all this stuff as well is it t2 or t1 i forget not t2 t1 i think pineal one or two something like that. we'll do that in cns though i don't remember uh superior vena cava uh so svc syndrome that's this thing right here you get a plethora uh facial plethora okay. uh basal uh brachiocephalic vein as brachiocephalic syndromes, uh, unilateral symptoms, brachial plexus that leads to shoulder pain, sensory motor deficits, uh, for example, atrophy of intrinsic muscles of the hand, okay. and phrenic nerve, hemidiaphragm paralysis, that's hemidiaphragm elevation on chest x ray. Okay. Uh, then you have superior vena cava syndrome that we just talked about it's the obstruction of SVC for example thrombus or tumor it impairs blood drainage from the head facial plethora note launching after fingertip pressure and a so you do that and it's not being uh, you know the blood is not coming back in less than two seconds so it's called launching uh, neck, jugular venous distension, laryngeal, pharyngeal edema. You can just imagine if there's something here, everything over here is going to get dilated, right? Uh, okay. And upper extremities edema. Commonly caused by malignancy, for example, mediastinal mass, pancose tumor, and thrombosis from indwelling catheters. Medical emergency can rise intracranial pressure if obstruction is severe. This leads to headache dizziness increase in risk of aneurysm rupture of intracranial arteries okay so headache dizziness increase in risk of aneurysm rupture of intracranial arteries cool 
uh, let's take a break here respiratory pharmacology h1 blockers also called antihistamines reversible inhibitors of h1 histamine receptors may function as neutral antagonists or inversive inverse agonists first generation diphenhydramine di um, diamenhydrinate chlorphenaramine and doxalamine names usually contain n and i or n and 8 in the name okay these are all antihistamines histamines clinical uses for allergy motion sickness vomiting in pregnancy and uh, sleep aid okay this is the mechanism of action reversible inhibitors of h1 histamine receptors okay uh, adverse effects are sedation anti-muscarinic anti-alpha adrenergic okay so they lower the blood pressure too uh, not what it's used for but because alpha was also you know vasoconstrictor so it blocks that action as well uh, second generation lorantidine uh, fexofenadine desloratidine and cetrazine names usually end in adine and cetrazine is second generation agent uh, clinical use is allergy and adverse effects are far less sedating than the first generation because of decreased entry into CNS uh, dextromethorphan that's antitussive agonis, antagonizes NMDA glutamate receptors synthetic codeine analog has a mild opioid uh, effect when used in access so this is important they'll test you on this okay and it's antitussive right so it antagonizes NMDA glutamate receptors this is important too uh, naloxone can give uh, can be given for overdose of dextromethorphan it has a mild abuse potential and may cause serotonin syndrome if combined with other serotonogenic agents so this is important as well so they'll test you on each aspect of this they might tell you that this guy is on SSRIs and then he had uh, you know taken this or some drug that caused uh, these symptoms so what drug was it uh, pseudoephedrine and phenylephrine. Uh, phenylephrine mechanism is they activate uh, alpha adrenergic receptors in nasal mucosa leading to local vasoconstriction uh, clinical use is uh, reduces hyperemia and edema used as nasal decongestants uh, right so leads to op uh, that is open uh, obstructed eustachian tubes right so these are the sprays that you use uh, the nasal sprays and all that they have these uh, and they cause vasodilation dilation and all that but what that does is uh, to create vasoconstriction the brain creates more and more like stimulates the uh, endothelium and all that stuff uh, more uh, to cause vasoconstriction basically so we'll, eventually what's going to happen if you have uh, chronic use of this the when you stop using these drugs the brain is not going to stop immediately right uh, stimulating the cells the cells are going to still be uh, stimulated so that's going to cause uh, refractory vasoconstriction okay and that's how you get uh, rebound congestion called rhinitis medico uh, medicamentosa so high, uh, adverse effects are hypertension, rebound uh, congestion, uh, rhinitis medicamentosa if used more than four to six days. It's associated with tachyphylaxis, can also cause CNS stimulation and anxiety or pseudoepidemic. Um, that's the one that causes that. Uh, pulmon pulmonary hypertension drugs, drug mechanism and clinical notes endothelin receptor antagonists uh, so we know what endothelin does right it causes vasoconstriction 
so antagonists are blockers so if you block endothelin it's going to cause vasodilation right uh, or yeah so competitively antagonizes endothelin 1 receptors so this causes decrease in pulmonary vascular resistance uh, okay so that's what it's used for clinical note is that it's hepatotoxic uh, so you have to monitor the LFTs uh, and an example of endothelial receptor antagonist is bosin 10 right uh, the way I remember this is uh, Bose speakers and speakers are usually coming in pairs of two right like that and then you have like woofer uh, driver and a woofer or a subwoofer driver and sub so it looks like lungs right uh, so Bose looks like that and then it has N in it and that's how you connect it to endothelin so Bose like that and then N for endothelin lung drug it's used for pulmonary hypertension okay uh, PDE5 inhibitors inhibits uh, PDE5 prostaglandin 5 uh, so that will increase uh, CGMP and we know what CGMP does it uh, activates NO right uh, release of NO or conversion of L arginine into NO was it L arginine I don't remember yeah L arginine nitric oxide to NO uh, from L citrulline also used to treat erectile dysfunction okay uh, why because how do you get erection it's when you have uh, you know dilated arteries uh, or dilated arteries in the penis that causes increased amount of uh, blood to go in there and this is the main cause of that and oh it vasodilates right so the blood can come in and that's how you get erectile function so when you give this and it inhibits that that means you won't have get the erections anymore so uh, wait no also call also used to treat this oh never mind yeah so when you do this uh, it increases this uh, and since it has a vasodilatory effects as NO okay uh, I was getting zoned out so anyways also used to treat erectile dysfunction contraindicated when taking uh, nitroglycerin or other nitrates due to uh, risk of severe hypertension right okay and uh, example is sildenafil okay so you have nitric oxide pathway so first we did the endothelial pathway for endothelial gets released endothelial receptor so over here uh, they convert the PIP2 to IP3 which releases calcium so here we have endothelial receptor inhibiting that right uh, this is a smooth muscle this causes vasoconstriction and increase in proliferation L arginine to L citrulline nitric oxide going into this the cell converting the GTP to G CGMP and that's doing that and this is uh, causing inhibition of that and then we also did uh, CCAMP so uh, prostacycline analogs uh, for PGI2 or prostacycline with direct vasodilatory effect of pulmonary and systemic arterial vascular beds inhibits platelet aggregation so adverse effects is uh, flushing jaw pain an example is Epoprostenol and ileoprost. Okay, so PGI2 prostacycline with direct vasodilatory effects on uh, pulmonary and systemic arteriovascular beds. It inhibits platelet aggregation. Okay, so ar arachidonic acid uh, converting prostacycline, uh, releasing that and then causing activation of CCAM. And the analogs also cause activation of this, and that leads to vasodilation and decrease in proliferation. Uh, we did this mechanism in biochem. If you just a real quick show of that, uh, 
GTP to C, uh, GMP to PKG, uh, NO, uh, the calcium uh, from this, and then IP3 uh, DAG going to calcium and activating PKC. So that's what this is coming back to as well. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, asthma drugs. Bronchoconstriction is mediated by one inflammatory processes and two parasympathetic tone therapy is directed at these two pathways okay so this is the inflammatory and this is the tone okay let's bring that up here Uh, inhaled beta 2 agonist. We know what beta 2 does, right? It acts on the heart and no, sorry, that's beta 1. Uh, it acts, acts on uh, the lungs, right? Uh, causes what? Uh, vasodilation. So anything that promotes beta 2 is going to promote vasodilation, right? So we inhale beta 2 agonist, right? So uh, albuterol, salmetrol, and metrol this is the one that has the quickest and this is the longest acting one okay quickest and shortest okay, okay uh, over here we have it right over there beta 2 agonist what does it activates uh, adenocyclase uh, that causes uh, release of ATPs for uh, bronchodilation right uh, Sorry, uh, the ATP comes in and activates uh, adenocyclase causing uh, secant, right? That's this thing right here. Uh, so ATP or whatever. And actually, this is how it works. So it should be adenocyclase making ATP. And then the ATP and adenocyclase complex uh, will convert CMP. Okay, so GS comes in with adenocyclase uh, that converts ATP to CMP, and CMP then does its action. Okay, so albuterol, salmetrol, and formetrol relax bronchial smooth muscles, can cause tremor and arrhythmias. Okay, uh, okay, it can cause tremor and arrhythmia. Again. This is beta drug, right? So, uh, albuterol is short acting, used for acute symptoms. Okay, so A is short acting. Okay, uh, and that's how you remember it: A for albuterol, A for acute. Okay, and then salmetrol and fometrol are long acting. Okay, in my language, sal means a year. So. That's a year is a long time, right? So it's long acting. That's how I remember it. Uh, inhaled glucocorticoids, glutagazone, and budesonide uh, inhibit the synthesis of virtually all cytokines. Inactivate NFKB, the transcription factor that induces uh, production of TNF alpha and other inflammatory agents. First line therapy of chronic asthma, this is important, this is the first thing we do. Use a spacer or rinse mouth after use to prevent oral thrush. Okay, so what does this do? Uh, glucocorticoids, uh, one, it does this, right? It in inactivates transcription factor, NFKB, uh, that produces TNF alpha and other inflammatory agents. So over here, we have it. Right there, uh, glucocorticoids uh, inhibiting phospholipase A2 and COX1. Okay. Um, yeah, so that uh, it's chronic, and then uh, you're gonna have someone who has asthma, and then you see that they have oral thrush. So oral thrush is usually what it's a it's it's something that happens in HIV, right? Uh, because of decrease in CD4 count, it causes increase in candidiasis and, uh, and you know, candidiasis infection. However, 
what's happening is glucocorticoids are suppressing immunity in the throat and so the throat is having infection of candida and creating oral thrush it's not that this person is suffering from hiv because yeah so that so you prevent it by rinsing the mouth or using a spacer okay uh, the mechanism of action is uh, fluticasone and butacinide right own is a steroid and you know sone is also a steroid i guess i don't know remember it somehow and remember the mechanism of it okay. uh, then on to muscarinic antagonists okay teotropium and ipratropium that's this one right here uh, it's blocking adenosine uh, no it's blocking acetylcholine uh, so it does it doesn't activate bronchoconstriction right because adenosine and acetylcholine they both uh, increase the bronchial cone causing bronchoconstriction so we inhibit that with muscarinic antagonists. Muscarinic is muscular, right? And bronchial tone is determined by the muscular musculature of uh, the lungs. Okay, so teotropium and ipratropium competitively block muscarinic receptors, preventing bronchoconstriction. Also used for COPD, and teotropium is long acting. Uh, I'm just trying to remember if I had a pin for this. Right, so it might might not make sense to you, but I'll just give you what I have. Teotro is you know there's tro in it, so. Tro is top musk blocker. So tro is pro at muscular antagonist or musk blocker. Okay, tro is pro at musk blocker. And that's how you remember teotropium and ipratropium is used to block the bronchoconstriction and bronchial tone. Okay. Uh, Antileukotrains, Miss Montelukast and Zafirlukast. This is easy because it has Lu in it, and Lu is for leukotriene, right? Uh, so leukotrains. What it does is it blocks this right here, cyst LP1 receptor which is uh, known to produce mucus secretion, plasma excitation, and eosinophil recruit, uh, recruitment, and they cause uh, bronchoconstriction as well. So you blocking that will prevent this. Okay, so Montelukas and Zafirlukas blocks leukotriene receptor, which is cyst-LT1 or cyst-leukotriene uh, 1, especially good for aspirin-induced or and exercise induced asthma then you have zilioton that's 5 lipooxygenase inhibitor this uh, decreased conversion of ercodonic acid to leukotrienes uh, however it is hepatotoxic then you have omalizumab which is anti immunoglobin e monoclonal therapy for this you just pronounce it omalizumab but instead of spelling it that way you spell it with the e Mali. Right, so omalizumab. Okay, so E for anti immunoglobin E monoclonal therapy. So what does that do? Uh you have it over here. Anti IG monoclonal therapy on It binds mostly unbound serum immunoglobin E and blocks binding of the receptor. Used in allergic asthma with increase in IgE levels resistant to inhaled glucocorticoids and long acting beta 2 receptors. So, if you just block this, it's not uh, the allergens are not going to attach to this, right? Uh, the allergen and IgE complex is not going to attach to the receptor, the FC receptor of this. 
right and if that doesn't happen what's not going to happen uh, the cell linking and the aggregation of the receptors which uh, which leads to degranulation right uh, okay uh, then you have um, methylxanthines that's theophylline likely causes bronchodilation by inhibiting phosphodiesterases for example uh, that leads to increase in CAMP levels due to uh, decrease in CAMP hydrolysis this is an important one theophylline okay uh, where is it right there okay uh, likely causes bronchodilation by inhibiting uh, phosphodiesterases okay so that's PD right there so it inhibits that so it doesn't uh, okay so it doesn't break down CAMP okay because CAMP gets broken down by PDE to make AMP so if you block that you have more CAMP and if you have more CAMP then you will have bronchodilation okay so level uh, sorry theophylline likely causes bronchodilation by inhibiting phosphodiesterases which leads to increase in CAMP levels due to decrease in CAMP hydrolysis limited use due to narrow therapeutic index uh, cardiotoxicity neurotoxicity metabolized by cytochrome p450 blocks action of adenosine um, PD, uh, pd4 inhibitor that's rome roughly luminous That's a new one, rough flu milu last. Okay. It inhibits phosphodiesterase as well. It increases CAMP bronchodilation. This also decreases airway inflammation. It's used in COPD to reduce exacerbation. Then you have chromones, uh, the chromalin. Uh, that's right here. What does it do? It prevents the mass to cell degranulation. It prevents acute asthma symptoms. Rarely used. Okay, it's rarely used. Anyways. And anti interleukin 5 monoclonal therapy. Uh, you should know what this one does. Right? It was in this part. right here uh, interleukin 5 it causes uh, it activates eosinophils right so uh, anti of that will prevent that right so it prevents eosinophil differentiation maturation activation and survival mediated by interleukin 5 stimulation for maintenance therapy and severe eosinophilic asthma Okay, that's what we use it for. Uh, they're called mepolizumab, resilizumab against interleukin-5. You have benralizumab against interleukin-5 receptor alpha. Okay. So right here. Uh, so this release of interleukin-5 is prevented by these two. And then uh, this receptor is inhibited by benralizumab. Okay, and that covers those. And you have pro-inflammatory mediators, leukotriene histamine uh, interleukins, uh, causing either acute response, pro-constriction, or chronic response, which is via inflammation. Pro-inflammatory cytokines go into the uh, the lipids, and then does this, this, and all this, and this, and cool. So, anti-leukotrienes and zillion. Zuliton will inhibit 5 lipooxygenase. I don't think we covered that. Everything else is covered. Okay. Uh, done with that. And then done with this for now.